Hello, this is your host, Adam Graham, from Pretty Much the Present. And in this video, we'll be bringing you a compilation of old-time radio detective podcasts from 2010. The podcasts are appearing, for the most part, unedited, except for some extraneous or repetitive elements that are being removed because this is a compilation. As I said, these are old, so any websites or offers mentioned may not be valid at the time you're listening unless you find them on our website currently. Now, with that said, here is a week of Old Time Radio Detective podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have any comments, send them to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley. That's podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Become a fan of the show on Facebook, facebook facebook.greatdetectives.net. And uh, if you've got a comment for the show, please call 208-991-GREAT-D. That's 208-991-GREAT-D. Four seven eight three. I got a comment here from Murph, um, who uh, wrote regarding the Better Man, where Dan Holiday was paired up uh, in a contest uh, sponsored by a rich, uh, a warped old, uh, warped man. Uh, writes regarding uh, Holiday's opponent. The other contested sounded to my old ears like. Jack Webb. Uh, and you know, listening to this the uh, second time after I got that email, I listened to it again and I could hear, uh, I could hear uh, what, uh, what Murph was talking about. I can't say for sure that it was Webb because there were a few points where it was kind of like, is this, I'm not really sure. Uh, but uh, Box 13 was most likely uh, recorded uh, because it started coming out in uh, 40, uh, in uh, 47 and 48. It was most likely uh, recorded sometime in early 47, maybe late 46, which could be the right time frame for a Jack Webb appearance. But not entirely certain, but nice catch there. I, I could definitely hear it as a possibly Jack Webb. We're going to get into today's episode of Box 13, The Dowager and Dan Holiday, in just a moment. Before we do get started, I want to uh, remind you that if you love classic films... The best way to be able to affordably access them at your leisure is through Netflix. With Netflix, you get a DVD in the uh, mail, you watch it, and you send it back. So you can watch It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, or uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Or many of Alan Ladd's great pictures, such as Shane. Uh, if you'd like to try Netflix, uh, there, uh, you can try it out for free. Uh, for two weeks, go to greatdetectives.net, click on the Netflix link. Uh, but let's go ahead and get into The Dowager and Ann Holiday. <laughs> Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. <laughs> Dear Mr. Box 13, I address you as Mr. because I assume you are of the male sex. If you're a woman, disregard this letter. Come to my home at 7546 Brandon Drive as soon as you receive this. I shall be expecting you at once, and I shall state my reason for writing. I shall state my reason for writing this when I have satisfied myself as to your qualifications. Very truly yours, Mrs. Matilda Cortland. Mrs. Matilda Cortland? Now, why should one of the richest women in the world and one of the least accessible be writing to Box 13? And now... 
Now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, The Dowager and Dan Holliday. Golly, Mrs. Matilda Cortland. Impressed, Susie? I sure am. Why, nobody ever sees her. And practically no one knows what she looks like. She hasn't had a photograph taken in, uh... Come to think of it, I don't ever remember seeing one. Maybe she's a refuge. Susie, you mean recluse. Oh, do I? <laughs> when Matilda Cortland wants help, it's got to be something big. Okay, Susie, Mrs. Cortland's wish is my command. See you later. The Cortland mansion on Brandon Drive was the showplace of the city. People craned their necks to look at it. But all they ever saw was the dignified prim exterior. Ah, I was privileged. I saw the inside. Because when I rang the front doorbell... Yes, sir? Oh, how do you do? I'm the man from Box 13. Oh, will you come in, sir? Follow me, sir. I followed the butler down the hallway. The house was just as I expected. It was the 19th century refusing to believe that the 20th had ever rolled around. Then... One moment, if you please, sir. Yes? I beg your pardon, madam, but the gentleman you were expecting has arrived. So him in. That will be all, Jessie? Yes, madam. Stand there for a moment. Huh? I said stand there for a moment. The room was darkened, the shades were drawn over the windows, and the heavy old-fashioned drapes let in very little light. Then my eyes became more accustomed to the darkness, and I saw her. Mrs. Matilda Cortland, practically a legend. She was about 75. Her white hair was drawn tightly back over her head and was covered by a jet-encrusted scarf. Her dress was a museum piece and it fell to the floor in heavy folds. Now you've seen Matilda Cortland. That's an accomplishment, young man. Yes, I know it is, Mrs. Cortland. Come closer. That's enough. Now, turn around. Turn, turn around? Yes, are you a sample of what this modern age has produced? It's very nice out there, Mrs. Cortland. Matter of opinion. Mm -hmm. How old are you? Thirty-two. You may sit down. Oh, thank you. Why didn't you come sooner? I only received your letter this morning. It's after one. I ate lunch. I've developed that bad habit. You could have had lunch with me. Well, the letter didn't invite me. No matter. This is your advertisement in the Star Times? Uh, yes, it is, Mrs. Cortland. I saw it by chance. I never read newspapers. I form my own opinions, political, social, and moral, without aid from the press. Some of us, Mrs. Cortland, like to hear other sides of the questions that may come up. Stop arguing with me. Mrs. Cortland, I came because you asked me to. I assumed you had something in mind when you wrote to Box 13. I didn't know it would be a discussion, which neither That's of us... That's enough, young man. Do you have a name? Oh, yes, yes. Dan Holliday. Daniel? Only when I'm being formal. Why did you put this advertisement in the paper? Well, I told her she listened without changing expression. When I finished... Then you don't accept payment for your services. <sighs> no, I don't. Very well. You're going to help me. Oh, just a moment now. I haven't heard what you want me to do. Does that matter? You advertised that you would go anywhere, do anything. Well, maybe what you have in mind won't interest me. Mr. Holliday, I want you to do this for me. All right, then tell me what it is. Come here this evening for dinner. Oh, I'm sorry, but I have an engagement. Cancel it. Well, I, I can't. Nonsense. Anyone can cancel an engagement. Look, Mrs. Cortland, this is the 20th century. I know there were days when the word of Matilda Cortland was law to the society of this city, when engagements were canceled right and left to leave room and time for your dinner parties. But, but I still have an engagement I intend to keep. You're unreasonable. No, correction. Independent is the word. No matter. But it does matter, Mrs. Cortland. Now, you'll excuse me. Oh, wait. Yes? Tomorrow night, then. I think I can make that. Seven o'clock. Please be prompt. Do I dress? Of course. And meanwhile, I'm supposed to guess what you want me to do. I know the dinner isn't all of it. And that's quite right. You will meet my grandson and a woman. And then? And then, no matter what I say, you're not to act surprised, astonished, or give the least sign that anything is strange or new to you. No matter what you say. You think you can manage that? I'll try, Mrs. Cortland. I'll try. Remember, what I say or do may startle you, even shock you. 
but under no circumstances are you to betray your feelings. Now, Jessop will show you to the door. I shall expect you tomorrow evening at seven. Well, box 13 has brought out some pretty fancy routines. But this one was different. I found out what it was all about that evening at dinner. I met a grandson who was about 25 and a girl who was, well, maybe a little younger than he. I was still wondering what it was all about, and so was the grandson, Peter. The girl seemed nervous, ill at ease. Matilda Cortland wasn't making it any easier for her. That's right. Uh, yes, Mrs. Cortland. Did you say your father had been an engineer? Oh, please, Grandmother. Peggy's told you he was five times. Peter, I am speaking to Miss Wright. Sorry. What sort of an engineer, Miss Wright? Well, he... Civil, mining, chemical, what? He was a locomotive engineer. Oh, really? On what railroad? Grandmother, please. Peter, do not interrupt. I, Peter, I, I'd like to go now. But, my dear, we were to spend an evening together. I'd heard so much about you from Peter that I feel that I'd like to know more. Yes, Mrs. Cortland. Uh, we really got to go, Grandmother. We're, we're expected somewhere. Oh? Where are you going? Well, does that matter? Yes. Where are you going? To the Club Pierre. What's that? Daniel, do you know? Oh, yes, it's a very nice club. Dancing, dinner... A cabaret? <laughs> they don't call them that anymore, Mrs. Cortland. Very well. I shall go along. What? I shall go along. Stop sounding like a motorboat, Peter. Well, Daniel, would you like to go? If you would. But, Grandmother, you, you can't go. Would I be barred because of my age? Oh, no, of course not, but... Then why can't I go? Well, I... I guess there's no reason, but... You'd have to leave the house. I didn't expect to carry it along like a turtle with his shell. Oh, of course not. There's a very good reason I want to come along. Isn't that right, Daniel? Uh, yes, yeah, yes, there is. I've decided that I've been locked away from the world too long. Now I have a reason for getting out into it, renewing an old acquaintance, so to speak. Moreover, since I'm going to be married, I... What? What, what did you say? Yes. Daniel and I are engaged. <coughs> Mr. Holliday, are you all right? I, uh... <clears throat> I never felt better in my life, I think. You must be more careful, Daniel. <sighs> yes, I, I can see that. Well, Peter, you and Miss Wright run along then. Daniel and I will join you later. Uh, yes, Grandmother. Come on, Peggy. Excuse me. I've reserved a table. You can just ask for me at the club. Very well. Look, Mrs. Cortland. Quiet. Now, what were you going to say? Why did you say that? About you and me, Daniel? Yeah, that's it. You saw that girl. That's right, yes, yes. What about her? What's she got to do with this? That girl's a fortune hunter. She's after Peter's money. Uh, my money right now. And where do I fit in? I think when she realizes Peter is not liable to inherit my money, we can forget her. In other words... Exactly. You would inherit my money as my husband. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You don't have any intention of keeping on with this, do you? I never start what I cannot finish. Well, I'm sorry, but you can count me out. Why? Because it's ridiculous. I love my grandson. I would do something ridiculous to make him happy. Oh, well, go talk to him, then. I've tried. He's infatuated with that girl. All right, forget that. What kind of a reputation do you think this will give me? I'll be the fortune hunter. Not at all. You earn a very good living from your writing. Yeah, I know, but... I have enough influence to keep this out of the papers. I promise you, this will be between you, Peter, that girl, and myself. No. No, I can't. I... Daniel, I'm an old woman. I have nothing in the world but that boy whom I love dearly. When I die, I want to be sure he's happy. I'm lonely, Daniel. Very lonely. The only comfort I have is Peter. And that comfort would be taken away if I thought for even a moment that his happiness would be ruined by a, a woman who cares nothing for him but for what money he'll have when I die. Please, Mrs. Cortman, what you're asking is... I know a great deal. It might cause you embarrassment. But believe me when I tell you that it cost me a great deal in pride just now to confide in you, a stranger. I know what people say about me. Matilda Cortland, tyrant, money bag, recluse, <laughs> all those and more. But... Let me finish. Then you can decide. 
I'm afraid to leave this house. Afraid? Why? Because I'm afraid of the outside world. When my husband died, I went on. Then my daughter died. My son-in-law died. Peter is all that's left. I want him to be happy, and I'm willing to sacrifice anything to see that he is. Mrs. Cortman, you're making it tough on me. It'll be just as tough on me as you put it. How how long does this go on, if I agree? Until I find out. <laughs> well, I'm a sucker, Mrs. Cortland. But all right. Thank you. Now, Daniel, please take me to the club pier. So we went to the club pier. I don't remember much about what happened, except that I felt like a goldfish in a bowl without water. Well, I played my part and went on for two days more. Then in my apartment... I've come to see you, Holiday, because I want to talk with you. All right, Peter, sit down and talk. You can't be serious. About grandmother, I mean. What makes you say that? Well, you just can't. Why, she's old enough to be your grandmother. She's charming, gracious... And rich. Money isn't everything. It must be to you. Now, wait a minute, Peter. What your grandmother does is none of your concern. It is when she makes a fool of herself, or when someone does it for her. Meaning me? Meaning you. I don't think I have. Besides, I'm having fun. I've learned to drive her electric runabout. It's a little slow, oh, but you're not even uh... serious now. How do you know? Because it's ridiculous. Maybe she thinks your romance is ridiculous. That's none of your business. All right. All right, it's none of my business. And what I do is none of your business. And you insist on going on with this? Why do you say that? Because if you do, I'll find a way to stop it. Oh? How? I don't know, but I will. Is that a threat, Peter? No, that's a promise. All right. As long as we're playing, oh, promise me, I can promise you that I'll take care of myself. We'll, we'll see about that, Holiday. And I warn you, you're going to get into trouble. <laughs> Now, back to The Dowager and Dan Holliday, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, it all looks so simple. Just go along with the game and tell Matilda Cortland called it off. Yeah, sure, that was all. Then one night at her home... Tonight, Daniel, you're taking me to the opera. Oh? Look, Mrs. Cortland, don't you think this has gone far enough? I'm not finished. Well, we're getting no place. Peggy Ryder says... I'll see the drugs of when we stop, Daniel. Now, hand me that case on the table there. Oh, this one over here? Yes. Here you are. Have you ever heard of the Cortland Emeralds, Daniel? Oh, who hasn't? Now you're going to see them. <whistles> Beautiful, aren't they? Well, I won't argue with you. <laughs> they were to go to Peter's bride. As they came to me. Mm, nice little trinkets. Each one is perfect and perfectly matched for the next. Twenty of them. Uh, you're going to wear that necklace? Yes. Uh, fasten it for me, Daniel. All right. As I fastened the clasp of the necklace, I got a funny feeling. Maybe it was the jewels themselves, green, glowing in the yellow light of the room. Then, when I finished... Thank you, Daniel. Now, if you're ready... All right, let's go. Oh, wait a moment. I think I hear Peter. Hmm? Grandmother, are you just about ready to... The emeralds? Yes, Peter, the emeralds. I'm wearing them tonight. But... But you can't. Why not, Peter? Well, I mean, it's... It's dangerous, isn't it? Why? Well, all I meant was... Are you sure the clasp is tight? It won't come loose or anything. Of course not. Come along, Daniel. Yes, sure. And Peter... What? You can close your mouth now. I didn't hear much of the opera because I kept thinking how strange Peter had looked when he saw the necklace. How Matilda Cortland had looked. As if warning her grandson to be quiet, say nothing more. Then the opera was over. I drove her home. And I went home to bed. Yeah? Who is it? Holiday. Uh huh. Open up. Well, who is it? Police. Police? Wait a second. Hey, what's up? 
You're Dan Holliday. Uh, that's what the name on my mailbox says. Why? Move over. Sergeant, stay out here. Now, wait. What's the big idea? Got a warrant to bring in. Me? What for? Sworn out by Mrs. Matilda Cortland. Why? Eh, yeah, let me see that warrant. You like the way it's written, Holiday? Well, what's the charge? Robbery. This is insane. What are you talking about? I can't talk any plainer than I did, Holiday. Robbery of what? Ooh, of about 20 emeralds. <laughs> after I came inside this house. It it was just after I'd left Mr. Holiday. No one else was with you. You know as well as I do that I didn't take that necklace. It was missing. Then look all over the house. The insurance company has already done that. Well, Holiday, you said that once. Did I? Well, you didn't answer it. I can't. Will you need me anymore, officer? No, I don't. Uh, excuse me. You can hang up Jess if I've taken it here in the library. Uh, yes, of course. It's for you, officer. Thank you. Hello? Uh-huh. Oh. Okay. Stay there. Got any good answers, Holiday? Answers to what? How the necklace got into your apartment? <gasps> This was a beauty. I was looking out of a frame that crowded me, but good. I knew Mrs. Cortland had that necklace when she'd left me last night. I saw it, yet how could it get in my apartment? And why? And so I saw Kling, and he pulled some strings, and I was out on bail. I had to get some answers fast, and I thought Peter could give them to me. I'm sorry, Holiday. I can't do a thing. Listen, you saw that necklace when your grandmother and I left for the opera last night. And I saw it when I brought her home. Then how did it get into your apartment? Maybe you've got an answer. No. Listen, your eyes popped out of your head when you saw your grandmother wearing that necklace last night. Why? I, I knew something would happen. How did you know? What gives you the right to question me? I'm doing it. <laughs> all right, go ahead and ask. I was with your grandmother all evening. And you know? I wasn't. If you want to check, go ahead. But it looks as though you're in a mess, Holiday. Well, there's nothing I could add to that. Sure, I checked. Peter was in the clear. He hadn't been near his grandmother from the time he saw us until the next morning. Yet someone had to take that necklace and plant it in my apartment. And it looked like a frame-up between Peter and his grandmother. But why? Why frame me? Why go through this whole elaborate fix just to fasten a crime on a guy they'd never seen before? And I got an idea. I went to the insurance company. Of course, Mr. Holliday, now that the necklace is recovered, we have nothing more to do with the case. But if it hadn't been recovered, you'd have paid the claim, right? Certainly. Mm. But it's not the insurance money they were after. Mrs. Cortland? <laughs> Certainly not. Why, she's enormously wealthy. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it is a little strange, come to think of it. What's strange, come to think of what? Probably nothing, but uh, we were due for our routine checkup in just two days. Checkup? Of what? Well, you must know we make a checkup on insured objects every so often. And one was due in two days? Yes. Oh, I see. I beg your pardon? Oh, n nothing, nothing. Well, thanks very much. But it still didn't make sense. It still came back to the necklace being found in my apartment. Then, then I figured out another angle. And my next stop was to see Miss Peggy Wright. What do you mean? What are you talking about? I asked a simple question, Miss Wright. And that was, when were you and Peter planning to leave? Leave? Leave where? Now, cut it out. You know what I'm talking about. I say you and Peter planned to elope. We didn't. We never even thought of it. Are, are you telling the truth? Of course I am. Why should I lie about that? I don't know. Look, Miss Wright, are you in love with Peter? Yes. You want to get married? If it weren't for her, we... But if I marry his grandmother, then you wouldn't get the money. Oh, I don't care about that. Hmm. Well, I could swear she was telling the truth. At first, I'd thought Peter had taken the necklace so that he and Peggy could get away from Mrs. Cortland. But it was a dead end again. And there was that other thing bothering me. Why frame me? Then I went back to see Mrs. Cortland. I can give you ten minutes, Mr. Holliday. That's all I want. Just a couple of questions. Wait. If I promise not to prosecute, if I drop the whole thing, will you forget it? Now, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You're willing to forget all this? Yes. 
Why? Because perhaps I like you. Oh, no, that's not it. Then I have nothing more to say. Yes, but I have. Why did you decide to wear that necklace to the opera last night? It's mine, and I wear it when I please. But why last night? And why was it missing this morning? It's a little too much of a coincidence that you wore the emeralds last night and that they were found in my apartment this morning. Please leave, Mr. Holliday. And Peter almost fell over when he saw you with that necklace that night. And... And what? And this morning, when you heard it was found in my apartment, you almost fell over. Come on, Mrs. Cortland. What's going on? Do you want money to forget all about this? No, I don't want money. I want the truth. And maybe even then I won't forget it. Jessup will show you out. Jessup will find himself on the end of a fist if he tries it before I find out a few things. I'll call the police. Go ahead, go ahead. I'll wait. Well, why don't you call? I have no wish to harm you. Mrs. Cartman, I... What were you going to say? Nothing. Nothing at all. I'm just getting an idea, that's all. An idea. Fantastic, but it made sense. I lined up my facts. First, Peter's reaction when he saw the necklace. Second, the insurance checkup was due just after the necklace disappeared. Third, Peter hadn't had a chance to touch the necklace between the time I saw it last and when it appeared at my apartment. Unless he and his grandmother were trying to frame me. That didn't make sense because there was no reason in the world for them to do it. So I called a cling, another chase around the city, and I found the man I was looking for. Okay. I had everything I needed. And I called that evening at the Cortland mansion. I made sure Peter and his grandmother were there. And I took Peggy with me. And in the library... This is the last time we'll see you, Mr. Holliday. I don't think so, Mrs. Cortland. Not after the little game we played. What do you mean? When we first started this twister, you said you'd do anything for Peter. What are you getting at, Holliday? And you, Peter, you said you'd get me in trouble. Listen. No, you listen. You planted that necklace in my apartment. Silence after that, huh? But it's true. You uh, wanted to frame me. Mm Mm-hmm. But you, Mrs. Cortland, you suspected he took the necklace, didn't you? you? You're quite mad. Oh, no. With the insurance checkup coming, you wanted to avoid a scandal because you thought Peter had taken the necklace. You had a paste one made. Uh-huh. I checked and found out. The paste one was the one you wore to the opera. And Peter... What? That double take you did when you saw the paste necklace almost floored you. Because you thought you had the necklace. You... You didn't mean to steal it, did you, Peter? No way. Holiday's right, Grandmother. So you reported the missing necklace, the paste necklace, Mrs. Cortland, never thinking the real one would show up. Peter, you you owe Mr. Holiday an apology. And there is the understatement of the year. Mr. Holiday, I... What can we do? Peggy. Yes? Come here. You too, Peter. All right. Peter, you wanted to protect your grandmother by showing me up as a crook. Mrs. Cortland, you wanted to protect your grandson any way you could. It seems to me a a lot of energy was wasted that could be used to good advantage. What do you mean? Why don't you stop trying to run other people's lives, Mrs. Cortland? Let Peter and Peggy get married. I'm sure it isn't his money she's at. I... If you don't, this would make juicy reading in the papers, I'm afraid. You wouldn't. Oh, Oh, yes, I would. Very well. Okay, Peter. You and Peggy run along, huh? Holiday, I... Ah, that's good enough. So long. And I, Mr. Holiday? You and I are going to the Club Pierre. You're very chivalrous, Mr. Daniel. (laughs) So you admit chivalry still lives. Okay, let's go. I'll get the electric runabout and we... No, no, no. Let's go in your car. The runabout's a little slow. And so everything's all right now, Mr. Holiday? It sure is, Susie. (laughs) <laughs> oh. What's so funny? I was just thinking. She couldn't have lost the paste necklace. All right, all right. I'll play straight, man. Why not? Because, 
because it would have stuck to her neck. See? Oh, I'll go get the mail for box 13. Good night, Mr. Holiday. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Welcome back. This has got to be on the high-end scale of happy endings uh, for uh, detective stories. Nobody in jail, nobody dead. Uh, but sometimes you get that at Box 13. So, nice way to start off your week. All right, well, we have an email here from Jeff. Oh, right. Thank you for the, taking the time to hear your series of detective podcasts and adding your commentary. Broadcasting them in their original order also helps put the cultural times during which they were originally aired somewhat in perspective. I'm surprised by how many of your listeners are able to listen daily. I store a full week schedule and listen in mass while working in the garden. Hmm. Guess it kind of depends on how your free times, uh, free time comes. Also of interest have been the comments, the likes and dislikes of other listeners. Personal favorites remain Sherlock Holmes and Johnny Dollar, while I'm not particularly fond of Regan. Uh, well, you may like the uh, Frank Graham version better, which will start in 20 weeks. As others have suggested, I'd love to hear the Nero Wolf series in its entirety and, uh, and do enjoy Richard Diamond. Well, be looking for an opportunity to uh, uh, have a say on whether Nero Wolf will go next. I uh, also writes, I'm looking forward to your treatment of Father Brown as I don't ever think, as I don't think I've ever listened to an episode uh, from the series. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for your efforts. Um, and uh, he has a nice quote in there from Nero Wolf, the more you put into your brain, the more it will hold, if you have one. Uh, thanks so much. And I have to say, the Father Brown series, that may be, uh, the rarest, the rarest episodes we actually are going to do on the show. Uh, of all these shows that um, I've heard, this had to be some, one, one where, I, where I racked my brain the hardest trying to find them, because I knew it was out there. I knew there were some episodes. Uh, and in the end, I actually found uh, two episodes. As far as I've been aware, there was only one in circulation. So you'll enjoy that once uh, Jeff Regan's over. Got a comment off of Podcast Alley. I'm totally addicted. I love the background information Adam supplies. I recommend it to everyone I know, and I really like these podcasts. Adam Graham's many histories are also entertaining. Well, thank you so much for your kind comments on Podcast Alley, and I do encourage you to cast your vote. That's at podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Uh, not a whole lot to say before we get into today's show. One thing I forgot is that, um, and I mentioned this on the page that you can find over at greatdetectives.net, but... Uh, this, uh, uh, Jeff, Jeff Regan, several of the scripts, because Jack Newman wrote uh, most of the Jeff Regan scripts, several of these scripts were reused on yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And one of those reused scripts was last week's show. Um, later became the purling matter on yours truly, Johnny Dollar. So that was the factoid of the day. Let's go ahead and we'll get into today's episode in just a moment. I do want to remind you, if you're going to book a hotel between now and the 31st, go to greatdetectives.net uh, and click the uh, special text link uh, on the right-hand side of the page. Till the end of the month, Priceline is bringing you the big deal guaranteed. Uh, for a limited time only, after making your Priceline.com name your own price, two-star or better hotel looking, booking, but before the day you check in, you find a better publicly available price, excluding taxes and fees, on another website for the same hotel and dates, call uh, Priceline, uh, and if you uh, qualify, they'll refund 100% of the difference between Priceline and the other site and give you an additional $25 refund to your credit card. Uh, in addition, for customers with U.S. billing uh, addresses, uh, they'll give you a coupon for $50 for your next purchase of a two nights or longer Priceline vacation uh, package. Uh, so just go to greatdetectives.net, use the name your own price feature, and uh, 
And if you're able to find a better deal elsewhere, then you will definitely get an even bigger deal. If you can't, um, can't you got the best price. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll get into today's episode of Jeff Regan, The Lonesome Lady. My name's Jeff Regan. I'm the lion's eye, his private eye. Gumshoe, keeper, Seamus, whatever you want to call it. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, International Detective Bureau. He's a guy who likes to make money. But when he makes money, I get into trouble. <laughs> Here's the kind of adventure you've been waiting to hear. Hard-boiled action and mystery as told by Jeff Regan, investigator. So stand by for trouble. Stand by for suspense. Stand by for adventure. In tonight's story, The Lonesome Lady. And now, here's Jack Webb as Jeff Regan. Well, this is the way it started. Everything was routine. Melody was at her typewriter working on the usual sheet of paper backed by the usual four carbons, routine. The smell of the lion's 50-cent cigar hung in the room, routine. And the air conditioning was out of order, all routine. I looked over Melody's shoulder and read the memo. Attention, International Detective Bureau, Anthony J. Lyon, from the American Insurance Company Claims Division. Here you are. Keep the original for yourself and give the other to Mr. Lyon. I guess you're going to be on me. On oh, what? You beautiful thing, you. Jeff, hmm? <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> don't do that. Somebody might vote here. Mr. Lyon, I'll tell you all about it. Isn't that a new boyfriend, huh? Not <laughs> Mr. Lyon's waiting for you. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Regan. Ever hear of a guy named John R. Renzo? Nope. A doctor named Maurice Wade? Nope. A French dame named Marie Rochelle Portier? Nope. Should I? Maybe. I don't know yet. It's all routine stuff on that American insurance company contract. They want us to do a little work for them. Their claim man came in about an hour ago all excited about Renzo. Kicked off early this morning. I can't very well meet him. It is a time and a place for wise cracks, and this isn't it. It figures. Lorenzo kicks off, and the American insurance company's going to have to kick in with $35,000 to his beneficiary. And that's Marie Rochelle Portier. No relation. A girlfriend, I guess. It's almost a bank buster for AIC. So, you want me to see her? No! Ticklish if it turns out to be legitimate. Now, you better look at the other angles before you see her. If AIC has to pay off to that dame, we might just as well say goodbye to their business. We can't stand much treatment like that. You mean you want me to find a way for them to get out of it? I didn't say that. If it's legitimate, they'll pay. That's nice. What I want you to find out is how a guy carrying $35,000 worth of life insurance winds up croaked in a hotel on Main Street with two dimes and three pennies sitting on the dresser. It could happen. Sure, it could happen. But you find out why it could happen. Renzo's worth 23 cents alive and $35,000 dead. And the county's going to have to plant him. The insurance company doesn't like it, and I don't like it. How'd he die? Well, the coroner says it was a hard job. The insurance company? The insurance office says Renzo applied for the policy three weeks ago. Approved ten days ago, and he kicks out today. Everything's fine. The papers. So what am I supposed to do? Find out what isn't fine about what that physical Renzo passed. Now, you can start with the insurance doctor, name of Maurice Wade. And get on him first. And call me if you run into any trouble. <laughs> The place I was looking for turned out to be a brand new three-story building on Wilshire Boulevard. In the hall, I could still smell wet plaster and cement. There was one name on the neon-lighted directory, Dr. Maurice Wade, Eternal Medicine, Diagnosis, and the number 310. The sign on the self-service elevator said, do not use, so I climbed the three flights of marble stairs. The first door at the top was 310. 
Enter. I enter. A blonde girl in a white uniform sitting at a small desk smiled up at me through sharp white teeth, showed me one well-shaped leg and two well-manicured hands, all routine stuff. How do you do? Have you an appointment? No, I know. And I was hoping I could see Dr. Wade without an appointment. Well, that's almost impossible. He's so busy these days. I'm Miss Porter, his nurse. Perhaps I can help you. Uh, my name's Regan, but I'm afraid I'll have to see him. Oh? Oh, if you don't mind, I'll just stick around and wait for him. Oh, he isn't in just now, and I was just about to go to lunch, Mr. Regan. Well, that's fine. We'll go together. Dr. Wade will be in at 2 o'clock. You can come back then. I get it. 2 o'clock. It was right then that my day began to change. I stepped outside the office door and walked over to the brand new stairway of that brand new building. Now get this. I stopped a minute because I thought I heard somebody opening the doctor's door. I turned around to take a look when I felt something brush my arm. The stairway suddenly turned upside down and began to walk up me. There was a lot of noise all around and I was trying to yell for somebody to shut it off. It got louder and louder and louder. It was then I decided this wasn't routine. Thanks for helping me throw him upstairs. He'll be all right now. I'll take care of him. He'll be all right. He'll be all right. I was lying on a leather couch in a white room. A tall, thin man with a hooked nose seemed to be running things. He was waving an arm at a vague crowd of people near the door. Then somebody I couldn't see shoved a bottle under my nose. Give him a whiff of that. There you are. I think he'll be all right now. Now then. Can you hear me, mister? No, don't try to move yet. Nothing broken, but you had quite a tumble for yourself, my friend. Quite a tumble. You might have been killed. That's what I was thinking. Somebody shoved me. What's that? I was shoved. (laughs) That's crazy. I was on the second landing when you come falling down. Wasn't anyone around? Why did anyone want to shove a man down a flight of stairs? I don't know. Plum bruise and battered, mister. When you get to thinking about it, you just got dizzy from the heat or something. How didn't you? Maybe. I'm oh, sure. Mary, hand me that like a good girl. Here you are. Yeah. Let's try a little of this. <coughs> Thanks. Can that help? Yeah. Have another. You want me to call you a taxi, Mr. Regan? No, thanks. I got a car out in front. I'd better you rest up a minute or two longer, friend. My name's Wade, Dr. Wade. This is my office. Wade? You're the man I came to see. Well, I don't believe I know you. You one of my patients? Oh, this is Mr. Regan, doctor. I explained that you took patients only on appointment. Mm-hmm. Well, as long as you're here, Mr. Regan, what can I do for you? Well, I'm not a patient been retained by the American Insurance Company to investigate a claim concerning a former patient of yours, a man named Arenzo. A private investigator. We're checking on a policy that was issued on him. You were the examining doctor. You don't represent the district attorney's office or anything like that? No, I don't. I'm with the International Detective Bureau. You don't have a warrant that says I have to show you my files. No, I don't. I thought that as long as you were employed by the insurance company and you conducted the examination... It's well, give me back my bottle, mister. And then you can get on out of my office. Huh? And get out fast. If I'd have known you was something like that, I wouldn't have drugged you up here in the first place. Now get on out of here before I throw you out. Well, you can see how things stood between Dr. Maurice Wade and me. I walked out of the place with as much dignity as I had left. I had other plans. There were other files to look at and other people in the city I could talk to. Detective Sergeant Salvatore Wendetti, morgue detail, was sitting in his office, chewing on a cold cigar, reading a traffic bureau memorandum on the new liability laws. Well, 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 if it isn't Jeffy the Regan. How are you, Jeff? Boy, I haven't seen you in a long time. Pull up a chair. What happened? Fell down a flight of stairs. Mm, you ought to be more careful. Lots of people get killed doing things like that. So what can I do for you? Sally, I want you to find out about a man named John R. Renzo for me. 
He died this morning, and your office is handling it. Renzo, Renzo, Renzo. John Renzo, Johnny Renzo. Yeah, sure, we got him in the icebox now. I want to see him handle it myself. No, no, thanks. I know he's dead. What else? Well, never really a bad actor, never really a good one either. Mind you, all the boys in the beat knew him. Why? Come on, tell me some more. Well, he made Lincoln Heights jail about nine months out of 12 on a vag wrap, one thing or another routine. Vagrancy? Just one of our lazier citizens, so he's dead now, so what's to it? He was insured for $35,000. Oh. <whistles> yep, that's what I'm thinking. So somebody's mighty glad to see little Johnny dead. Who gets it? Her name's Marie Rochelle Portier. No relation. A hot time in the old town tonight for her. Mm-mm. Tomorrow night. The insurance company has 24 hours to investigate. Ah, that's what you're doing. All right, Regan, what else? Well, you got the coroner's report? Oh, sure, sure. Right here, came in an hour ago. It was a hard job. You sure? Positive. No one better than Johnny Renzo. It was bound to happen the way it did sooner or later. Was he an old man? Forty-five, fifty, maybe. You can never tell on that kind, but all of us around here knew it. Knew what? That his ticker's been bad for years. Every time he made the heights, it'd give him a soft job. Couldn't take a chance. Hey, look, Sally, are you telling me it was chronic heart condition? I'm telling you it was a chronic heart condition. Well? Mm-hmm. I need that telephone. Ah, ah, not this one. Only inside call. Try Try the one across the street. Hello. This is me. I ran into some trouble. What kind of trouble? Well, you, you'll have to get me a warrant or something so I can get in that doctor's office. What? He wouldn't play ball. He threw me out. Now, the coroner's report shows that Renzo has a chronic heart condition. Then he never should have passed a physical. I thought that'd get through to you. But we'll have to find out what's in that doctor's office before we can do anything about it. Now, look. Get a hold of one of those double-breasted lawyers and rig up a thing, will you? Hey, Melody, get my lawyer on the phone. It may take the rest of the day to get you in there legally, and we haven't got the time. So get busy. I just told you, I can't get in. If I can't get in, I... Can't get in. I hung up the phone, stepped out of the booth, and crawled into my car. I was sitting there fumbling with the keys, wondering how I was going to get to those files when somebody else figured it out for me. He was a big man in a brown sport coat. Take it easy, Pilgrim. I just want to talk to you a minute. Well, that's tough, Pilgrim, because I don't want to talk to you. I've had a busy day and I... Wait, oh! I wouldn't try anything like that, Pilgrim. I just got here. Ain't no lot to hold. Come on, this one's just basic. I can tear your arm right off if I have to. Wake up, Seamus. I'm here on business. Yeah? What kind of business? You just been in to see when Daddy? Sure, I've been in to see him. He's a friend of mine. By the muscle act. Just to make sure you don't start hollowing your brains out of something. I'll take it off. Okay, so what do you say? Ooh. What do you say about what? You know what. Renzo. Well, the county's going to bury him. More, Seamus. <laughs> Keep talking. Only makes sense. He's dead for good. But, oh! More. He died of a heart attack this morning. Somebody gets 35000 bucks because of it. And you've been seeing people. A doctor, when Daddy... Uh, stay next on your list? Maybe. Oh, is that what you want to know? Yeah. You're a good boy, Regan. Now, here's what you want to know. You forget everything you know about anything. You don't say a word to nobody. No one. Understand? No one. Not even your own mother. Just forget. Get it. All right. Now, remember, not a word to anybody or else. I wonder if you do as good without a gun. Oh! I'll see you later, Pelton. Sure you will. Sure you will. But in case we miss connections, and so as you won't forget me, here's something to remember me. Oh! So long, Pilgrim. We'll return to Jeff Regan, investigator, in just a moment. 
The Army Nurse Corps Reserve still has commissions available. If you're a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officer's reserve. Those who meet the high standards and qualify to serve with this fine organization may elect active or inactive status. Nurses requesting inactive status will continue with civilian nursing but stand ready to serve in time of emergency. In addition, they have the opportunity to take advantage of special training courses. Nurses who request active status enjoy the same pay and privileges as all other officers. Graduate work is provided at the Army's most modern teaching centers, and the nurses obtain educational experiences that benefit them in both civilian and military nursing. Now, if you believe you qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington 25, D.C. That's the Adjutant General, Washington 25, D.C. And now, back to the story of the Lonesome Lady and... Jeff Regan, investigator. This wasn't routine either. It was brass knuckles, a big man in a brown sport coat in the front seat of my car. I guess I fell onto the horn into my steering wheel. I couldn't seem to sit up straight and get away from the noise. Trouble, Sam. Hey, don't you like peace and quiet? Hey, come on, sit up. Oh. Oh. Yeah. What happened to you? I don't know exactly. I don't know. Gee, Gee your face is cut up a little bit. You have an accident or a smash up? Yeah, something like that. You want me to call a cop? No, no. I'll handle this myself. Yeah, but don't you think you ought to go home and get some rest? Uh, maybe you ought to find yourself a sawbone or something. Huh? Uh, Maybe you ought to find yourself a doctor to kind of fix you up. You're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that's a good boy. You take care of yourself, There's doctor on the door, doesn't it? The office is still open, isn't it? Yes, but I thought Dr. Wade told you that he didn't want you here. I heard him, but this is different. If he doesn't see me now, I'll phone the state medical board and the lawyer and anybody else who's handy and make him a first-class Simon Legree for refusing me emergency treatment. Now, cut him out. Oh, you're hurt, Mr. Reedy. Oh, please sit down. Sit down right here. Where's your doctor, lady? He isn't in here. He's already gone for the day. Let me see. What happened? You tell me, lady. I'm just a peaceful citizen looking for a doctor. Oh, uh, sit still. That's a nasty bruise on your forehead. Yeah. I got some better ones where a man tried to cave in all my ribs. Uh, hold still. Lift up your face to the light. Mm-hmm. That's better. Ooh. Tender? Mm-hmm. First the stairs, now this. You've had quite a day, Mr. Regan. Maybe you ought to quit. Uh, hold that right there. Mm-hmm. While I touch up this cut on your chin. Mm-hmm. Uh, who'd you say you uh, worked for? International Detective Bureau. I'd resign if I were you. They're working you too hard. What's happened lately isn't exactly routine. What happened lately? Well, I found out that the man who died this morning had a chronic heart condition and he should have never been insured. Your doctor's in this up to his ears for passing him. Go on. A big man in a 
brown sport coat doesn't want anybody to look into anything. He's the one who did this. That's right. Hmm, that should hold you. Thanks. Oh, wait a minute. Where do you live? Huh? Your address. I'm coming over to your place tonight. You are? If what you say is true, my doctor's going to get 5 to 15 in San Quentin for doing a fix on an insurance examination, and I might be dragged into it. And I wouldn't want that to happen. So? So I'm digging up that file and bringing it over to your place, and we'll see what's what. Why not look at it right now? Isn't here. We just moved to this place three days ago, and half the stuff is still in the old office. All right. I'll buy that. Try 1720 North Tap, 308. In about two hours. Why so long? You need some rest. Besides, your shirt's bloody. Well, what was that name? John R. Renzo. R-E-N-Z-O. All right. You can expect me. Feel better now? Yeah, much better. <clears throat> you know, you freeze me, lady. Your boss throws me out. You fix me up. You help me. Maybe I wouldn't have fallen down those stairs if you hadn't sent me out to eat alone. Call me Mary, if you like. I thought it'd be something like that. Mine's Jeff. I've had a hard day, Mary. I know. But maybe it'll be a better day from now on, Jeff. You know, I had a feeling I was going to like you. <laughs> Just about then that I remembered the beneficiary. She was my last call. I bucked beach traffic out Wilshire and pulled up in front of the Beverly Hills address Lion had given me. A row of brass mailboxes on the outside of a four-unit court told me that Marie Rochelle Portier lived there. The man in overalls watering the lawn blinked at me, frowned at the cut on my chin, pointed to his own, and shook his head. I nodded back, wondering what Marie Rochelle Portier, or whoever she might be, whatever a racket might be, looked like. I found out. Yeah. It was the big man without his brown sport coat. This time it was swimming trunks, and he looked as big as a super cheap. I threw my whole arm into his face. He staggered backwards into the room, trying to get his balance. I let him have another one in the stomach. He was out of condition. One more, and his chin was cut. went down, taking a lamp, a card table, and a glass of warm lemonade with him. Oh, yeah. It's real good to see you again, Pilgrim. All right, Jamie. It's all right. You're, you're the champ. Come on, get up. Get up. I might have known I was going to find you here. Where's your girlfriend? No, no, no. Just a minute. Oh. I said, where is she? She ain't around. Ain't no one around but me. Honest. Okay, you give it to me. What are you talking about? I've met citizens like you before. Oh. Now, come on, make it straight. Oh, all right, all right. Oh, you busted my head. Help make it straight. Marie's my girlfriend. She calls me today, tells me what you look like. Tells me where you'll be. Tells me what to do. I do it. She knows who an insurance stick will go to. All right, go I on. I catch you at the morgue. You're nosy. She says to rough you up a little bit, make you forget what you're doing for a while, I... Find you like she says and do what she says. And, uh, nothing personal, in it. What about the doctor? Did he split with you and her? Ain't no doctor in on it. Just me and Marie. How'd she fix it for Renzo to get insured? I don't know. She's got connections. She gets around. That's smart guy. Come on, spill. Honest, honest. That's it, Shamus. That's all. That's all there is to it. We worked it a couple of times before. I don't know how she fixes it, but she does. I do all the heavy work and we get along fine. Now and then somebody gets excited, and I have to cool him off for a time. But, but, no, oh, that's it. Straight. Honest. Hey, what are you doing? Shut up. Well, now, don't call the cops. Give me a break, will you? Will you shut up? Lance. It's me. Regan, where have you been? I'm calling from the address of Marie Rochelle Portier. I told you not. Look, there's a big ape here who roughed me up today, trying to put me out of commission. I don't care about that. We have only 12 hours. Come on out and pick him up and get a statement for a warrant. Warrant? For who? For Marie Rochelle Portier. This monkey can give you enough to have her picked up. She's the one we want. You sure about that? I found out that the doctor who wouldn't let you into his office is in a lot of trouble. 
Got a wife suing him for divorce, and he no, might have no, been trying... No, no, it's support here, Dame, we want. As soon as you get a warrant on her, it'll make that insurance policy invalid. I still don't trust that doc. It's early yet. Why don't you oh. hop over? You bring in a couch out here? Look, Seamus, I got a little dough, and it, it'd come to more than a ton a day in expenses you're getting well, if you want to. Now you. I, well, oh, oh, oh. Stay here, Pilgrim. I'm tired. I'm going home. <laughs> About me? No. The janitor let me in. I told him you were my brother. That's nice. You didn't come straight home and get some rest. No, I had a couple of things to do first. Well, sit down. I fixed you a drink. That's good. Hot day and all. Thanks. Now, uh, tell me about your doctor. Huh? Hmm? Some things I uh, know already. His wife's suing him for divorce, trying to get every penny he's got. He doesn't like me. That's it. Or maybe he just doesn't like any private detective or anybody else who might be working for his wife. Huh? Maybe. Uh, and if I can spot a man who's being taken to the cleaners, he's one. He's pretty touchy these days about all the trouble she's probably caused him. What's this got to do with us? The stars are coming out. Yeah, just straightening out. Well, if that's the way things are with him, then my job's finished. Good. Now we can relax. <laughs> You've been working much too hard. Yes. Put your arms around me. Feels good. Good to have arms around you in a big city like this. Such a big city. So many people. Mm-hmm. You're nice, Jeff. Sometimes it's so lonely. And sometimes it's like this. Sure. Sure, Marie. Darling. Marie Port here, Mary Porter, it's all the same to me. No, don't reach for it, lady. I took it out of your purse. You, you I know, tricked. I tricked you. I've been wanting to trick somebody ever since you shoved me down that flight of stairs this morning, ever since you shagged your big boyfriend on me. I'll kill you. I'll kill no, you. I'll not kill. today, you won't. I'm not insured. All right, take it easy. Oh, let me go, Jeff. Let me go, please. You were so lonely in the big city that you just sat down and past time making out phony medical reports and counting the insurance checks that you collected on bad bets. Oh, please, Jeff, I... Oh, just let me go, please. So you have me thinking that a doctor's phony when the only thing that's bothering him is a wife and a divorce. Oh, Jeff, listen to me. And when I start getting close, you try to scare me off. And when I get really close, you figure to drop over and put on a good head. Oh, Jeff, Jeff, listen to me. They'll send me to prison. They'll they'll make me grow old and ugly there. Oh, Jeff, please, please let me go. I'll do anything. You can let me go. You can, you can. You will. Oh, please, Jeff. Me again. Got that warrant? Yeah, he spilled. Oh, Where are we going to find that dame? She's probably skipped. Oh, no, she's yeah. at my place. Oh, what? Do anything, Look, anything. Get somebody over quick, will you? Oh, please. Get him over while she's still here. Please. Well, I told it all to the lion, and he told it all to the American Insurance Company. And they renewed our contract. She's being arraigned next Monday. What happens after that is up to the jury. Melody had a question. Jeff, what do you think they'll do to her? Well, she'll get about ten years, I guess. If, um, if Mr. Lyon hadn't had that contract with AIC, would you have turned her in? Sure, I'd have turned her in. It's my job, isn't it? Well, it's a big city. A lot of lonesome people down there. They allowed her one call when they took her to jail. She called here asking for you. Jeff, 
Why did she do that? I don't know, Melody. I don't know. Jack Webb is starred as Jeff Regan, with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. Eve McVeigh was heard as Mary Porter, and Ken Christie as the big man. It's CBS, same time next week, for hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator, as he tells the story of the lady with the golden hair. Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by E. Jack Newman, produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with original music by Del Castillo. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Uh, we just heard, uh, I think, one of the hallmarks of Jack Newman uh, script writing. I've been listening to a lot of Newman's five-part Johnny Dollar episodes, uh, research, uh, and uh, I've noticed... I've noticed in those episodes, he really likes to give little verbal tics and catchphrases to his radio characters to kind of add a little bit of, um, of, of, of character to them. Uh, and it really helps your imagination. Uh, this week, it was the guy saying, Pilgrim. Uh, last week, it was the guy asking, how's everything going in Los Angeles? Um, and uh, you hear that as well in the Johnny Dollar episodes. Uh, in one episode, there was somebody who uh, uh, tended just to say "gee whiz" a lot, uh, and it's a fascinating little trick he, uh, that Newman used uh, to make the stories a little bit more real. Uh, that, and of course, the end part always leaves you with that real sense of Regan as the ultimate in world-weary Seamuses. Um, though that can get repetitive, and they do change it up throughout the series, as we'll hear. Uh, this one was not made into a Johnny Dollar script, uh, but it, wa it was uh, a similar idea was used by Newman in a uh, five-part serial from December of 55 called The Lansing Fraud Matter. I have an email from Lise who writes in... I love the show. I'm completely addicted. I'd appreciate if you could explain what are the advantages of getting the app versus following the show on your website. Are there any features that are only available on the app? Well, great question. Uh, you can get that by clicking the banner at greatdetectives.net or uh, just searching the uh, uh, searching the iTunes store. Uh, the big benefits of the app are as uh, are, are as follows. Uh, we do do some bonus episodes for the app. Uh, the big thing we do uh, is we do episodes of uh, featuring some of the stars of our detective shows in non-detective roles. Uh, we've done Alan Ladd in Shane. We've done uh, Basil Rathbone in Captain Blood. And coming up in a couple of weeks, we're going to do Jack Webb uh, in an episode of Escape called... A shipment of uh, mute fate. So you get those little bonus episodes. You also get commentary with the movies. Uh, so once you finish watching the movies, you can go in um, and you can press to play the bonus content. Uh, if you're near, uh, and of course this requires having an internet connection, uh, and you also have uh, ways to contact the show directly from uh, the app. Uh, you can just uh, press a contact button and email. Uh, you can also Twitter, visit the Facebook site. Uh, and if you've got an iPhone, you can just press a button. You should just be able to press a button to call in and to leave a voicemail. Uh, Lisa also says, uh, also, if you had a donate button on the side, I would happily contribute. Thanks. I had actually uh, taken the, the uh, donate button I had been using off because it hadn't been working for me. Uh, but after getting your email, I went ahead and put another one up, just a regular PayPal button. And so that's added on. And uh, thank you so much for the uh, comments. Have a very simple comment on, from Podcast Alley. Love Let Georgia do it. Well, so do we. We're going to get into that in just a second. Before we uh, do get started, though, I want to remind you 
that Netflix gives you the ability to choose the type of movies that you want to watch. And you have flexibility. I know a lot of people have busy schedules, and when you get busy schedules, you can get light fees. Or if you check a video out from the library, you can get fined. But with Netflix, you check out a video, uh, you watch it when you have the time, and then you return it at your leisure. So it's total convenience right at your doorstep. Go to greatdetectives.net, click on the Netflix link. But let's go ahead and we're going to get into today's episode of Let George Do It. This one is called The Moneymaker. So let's go ahead and listen and then we'll come back. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger is my stock and trade. If you find yourself way out on the limb and don't know how to get off, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, if ever a man needed help, I do. There is a matter that involves not only millions of dollars, but several million people in a country I'm not at liberty to name. Believe me, I call on you only after a great deal of thought. What I know is just too much responsibility for one man to carry. I feel if anyone can help me, it would be a man. It would be a man like you, and it's signed Martin Kirsch, President, Bonded Paper Corporation. Well, weren't you listening, George? Mm-hmm. Matter that involves millions of dollars, millions of people, a country I'm not at liberty to name. Doesn't that get a rise out of you? Well, Angel, I'm trying to suppose I'm the head of a paper company. I make paper for water cups, greeting cards, confetti, brown paper to wrap bologna in. I doubt if any of that covers Mr. Kirsch's problem, whatever it is. Now, just what kind of paper would cause a sedately hysterical letter like this one? Your hat, Mr. Valentine. <laughs> Brooks, see, if I didn't have you to read my mind, I wouldn't know where I was going next. The Bonded Paper Corporation. <laughs> I imagine you're more observant than most people, Mr. Valentine. Oh, uh, well, Mr. Kirsch? On the way in, you probably noticed several men watching you and Miss Brooks very carefully. Yeah, I couldn't help it. I could feel their eyes boring into the back of my neck. Police, Mr. Kirsch? No, Miss Brooks. My own private guards. Oh, now, wait a minute. You've got me winging here. I can understand the precautions if this were a bank or a mint. It's a little of both. But maybe I'd better explain. Yes, I wish you would. This isn't just a paper mill, Mr. Valentine. Ours is a very special organization, one of the very few of its kind in the world. Oh? My family established it more than a hundred years ago. The paper we turn out here is used for bonds, stock certificates, negotiable securities, even money for certain foreign countries. Oh, well, now I see what you mean by a combination bank and mint. It's a tedious and very scientific process to make paper so individual that it can't be duplicated by anyone else. Each one of our clients gets his own particular type of paper with characteristic watermarks and secret composition. Well, I knew the government went to all that trouble, Mr. Kirsch. We do the same thing, only on a private basis. Which brings us to what? Two reams of paper which can destroy the financial system of an entire country. What? Ah. See, Miss Brooks, an expert engraver can make plates that will produce counterfeit money almost impossible to detect. What they can't do is duplicate the paper. And despite the guards, two reams of this paper are missing, is that right? Yes. The first time in the history of our firm. Just how did it happen, Mr. Kirsch? That's what baffles us all. All the men here are craftsmen in their field. They've been carefully investigated, and they've been with us for years. I see. One day last week, a fire broke out in the loft building next to us. The Estrelita Candy Company, naturally, there was quite a bit of commotion. Firemen running in and out of here to get on the roof next door. Anyway... At the end of the day, when we took inventory, which we always do, these two reams of paper were gone. Stolen. Uh-huh. Well, that doesn't give me very much to work on, Mr. Kirsch. Anyone posing as a fireman could have been in and out of here that day without being noticed. I know. But still, that paper must be found at any cost and with the utmost secrecy. Well, what was the paper to be used for? Money, Miss Brooks. Actually, I can't reveal... The name of the country. But consider this. Two reams of paper. One thousand sheets on which can be printed currency of any denomination. Millions in currency indistinguishable 
from the money that's already in circulation. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. All that lucre suddenly dumped into a country could start one whale of a panic. The mere rumor of this paper being stolen could cause wild speculation. That's why I thought it would be best to deal with one individual like yourself. Oh, I'm flattered. The thing to remember, Mr. Valentine, is that time is of the essence. Whoever stole that paper either has the plates already made or is working on them now. Well, at the moment, I don't even know where to start, Mr. Kirsch, but uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> Lieutenant Riley. Believe me, Lieutenant, I'd tell you more about this deal if I could. Well... Please, Lieutenant, play ball. Look, I, I'm not holding out just out of loyalty to a client. This is something big. <sighs> Valentine, if you talk me into a deal that's going to blow up in my face, I I'll... I promise you it won't. Uh, okay. The guy you'll need to work with you is Jigger Collins. Okay. Now, you think he knows all there is to know about forges and counterfeiters? <laughs> Listen, when it comes to hot money, this guy is an encyclopedia. Why, we got enough on him right now to send him back to jail. Then why is he running around loose, Lieutenant? He isn't. We know where he is and what he's doing every minute. Oh. You see, Miss Brooks, we have to have our sources of information. And Jigger knows that if he doesn't give us the right dope when we want it, we'll slap him right back in the can. Well, thanks a lot for this, Lieutenant. Well, here. I'll give you his address. It's a rooming house, Forsyth Street. Number 76. Okay, got it. Maybe I'm getting feeble-minded, but uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. What's that? I'll talk to Jigger. I'll even tell him I'll take the finger off of him if he plays ball with you all the way. Maybe that'll help. You know you can be awfully sweet sometimes, Lieutenant. Oh, oh, oh I'm just trying to... <clears throat> uh, look, Valentine, if this case of yours is so all-fire important, why don't you get going? <laughs> Yeah, I spoke to the lieutenant, Mr. Valentine. Yeah, Jigger. Yeah, don't worry about me cooperating. I was waiting for a chance like this. I'll do anything to get those boys off my tail. Well, this is your chance, all right. Okay, okay. Now, let me get this straight. Now, Valentine, you want to know who I think of first if you was talking about a re big counterfeiting job. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Fred Biglow. Just like that. He makes the best place in the business. Why, that guy... Hey, wait a minute. What is it? Biglow's in town right now. Huh? I was wondering why. He ain't been around for years. Well, well, well. It might be just the lead we're looking for. Well, you've got to start somewhere, George. Chicken, you're going to introduce me to Biglow. Huh? Are you not... Yeah, you're going to say I'm fresh out of jail. I'm in town looking for a connection. Yes, but who are you supposed to be? Maybe you can answer that, Chicken. Me? Who do you know just got out of stir? Somebody who wouldn't be in town right now. Somebody Biglow wouldn't know. Uh-uh, friend. You're playing with dynamite. Fred Biglow is tough. He makes it a point to know things. Now, for instance, he'd know every ex-con I know. He'd spot you as a phony in no time. Oh, darling, I don't like this setup. You never did anything like this before. Hey, now, look, certainly, Jigger, I can pass for somebody Biglow would take to his bosom, if I'm a good enough actor. Come on, I'll think hard. Yeah, I am. Want a cigarette? Oh, thanks, I don't smoke. I... Hey, wait. Huh? Yeah. I did a rap back east with a guy named Art Saunders. Go on, go on. And the poor jerk didn't come out. He didn't have no friends, no relatives, no nothing. You could be him. Nobody knows or cares if he's dead. You think fast, Jigger. Too bad you didn't decide to play it straight. You might have done pretty well for yourself instead of being jungled up in this worm-eaten rooming house. Oh, I guess it's just the early environment. Done it. That's what the psychologist in the jail always tells me. But are you sure you know enough about Art Saunders, Jigger? Bigelow would check, you know. I know everything about Art Lady. And what you don't know, I'll pick up at headquarters by teletype. I don't know. Even if I get you to see Bigelow, Mr. Valentine, you're going to have to walk light. Like I said, he, he don't take in so easy. And like I also said, he's a tough baby. Yeah, well, you just arrange for me to meet him. Yeah, but I don't know exactly where he lives. But I know he operates from the, the Claremont Hotel. You got my number. Call me up when you get it set. Well, let's go, Brooksy. Okay. You can brief me on Saunders later, Jigger. Okay, Mr. Valentine. George, you're taking a terrible chance. Hold it, Angel, and listen to this carefully. Brooksy, you're as important in this deal as I am. If I line up with Bigelow, it's going to be a long time before he trusts me. Yeah. From now on, you and I don't even know each other. George. But you're my only contact. 
If there's anything important, we'll leave a message for each other. First with Jigger. If that doesn't work, we can trust Paul behind the cigar stand downstairs in our building. Yeah. And then there's Marcus, the boot black. You got it straight? Mm-hmm. But, George, how do you know a stool pigeon like Jigger won't call up Bigelow and tell him who you are? I don't know. But then they don't might... Don't worry, Angel. You'll see me around. A guy'd be a fool not to come back to something like you. Hmm, George. I'll promise you one thing, Brooksy. When I meet Bigelow, I'll be as much like the late Art Saunders as anybody can. Jigger, tell me all about you, Saunders. Said I might find some use for you. Well, you know how it is, Mr. Bigelow. You get out in a free and you want to make some connections. Oh, sure, sure. Saunders, meet a couple of the boys. Hi. How do you do? Hi. Ask him what he does so good we can use him. I'll get to that, you baldo. Well, I can handle myself pretty good. I don't dress too bad and I can push queer money in the best of circles. That sort of makes me your kind of guy, don't it? Look, Mr. Bigelow, you said this was going to be a big deal and not too many people in it. All right, Eddie, all right. Yes, Saunders, I heard about the rough deal you got back there at Joliet. Joliet? Yeah. <laughs> you got it wrong, Bigelow. I spent my time in Fredericksburg. Oh, yes. Yeah. Guess I got it wrong. Well, I don't know, Saunders. Perez here, I mean your baldo, handled the route pretty well. Not that we ever needed, of course. Of course not. <laughs> and Eddie's pretty fancy with his fists. Eddie, why don't you show it, Saunders, what I mean? Hey, what is this? I'll show you what he means. You'll never do it that way, oh, man. Mark. Hey, let go. Oh, when you swing like that, you might lose an arm. Hey, he's breaking my arm. Stop him. Quiet. Stay out of this, you baldo. Oh, what do you say, big oh. Let him go. Oh, my arm. Now, what do you say we stop kidding, big low? If I passed all your tests... Tests? Yeah, you tried to trip me up about the jail I was in. You had Eddie throw a punch at me to see if I reacted right. You checked and found out that nobody can do that to me without ending up with a broken arm. You satisfied him, Saunders? I think so. Say, uh, how do you get a hold of a guy's arm like that? I'll show you sometime, Eddie. No, never mind. Okay. When do I begin to work, Piccolo? As of now. But we'll talk about it later. Meanwhile, move your stuff into Eddie's room. It's down on the fourth floor. Come on, I'll show you. Thanks, Bigelow. Thanks a lot. Bigelow, why do we need him? This is no strong arm job. Oh, we need him very much, you baldo. Why do you think I tested him? Made him feel we're convinced he's Art Saunders. Well, is he not? No. You see, I know Art Saunders is dead. <laughs> Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about smoother driving. If you've picked August for your motoring vacation, here's a suggestion for making your trip more pleasant. Get a chassis lubrication tomorrow at an independent Chevron gas station or standard station. Here they have more than a dozen different RPM oils and greases. Each one is tailor-made to save wear on part, to seal out grit, dust, and moisture to eliminate noise and give you smoother, cushioned riding. And at any of these stations, a thorough grease job is also a clean job. No smudges or smears to worry about. So for happier riding and real economy, get a chassis lube tomorrow at a standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say, and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine with George facing this situation. You're on the trail of two reams of paper, 1,000 sheets. Not important? Yes, but a foreign country happens to print its currency on this particular kind of paper. You find out that a tight little gang of counterfeiters is working on a big job. You worm your way in. You don't know it, but they've got your tab for a phony. Fortunately, the hulk of the man whose hotel room you share doesn't know that you're not Art Saunders. Yet. Let's have that again, Art. Oh, no, no, not Let's again. See, I, uh, I throw a right cross at you. Before I know it, I got my arm pinned up in back of me like this, huh? Yeah, that's right, that's right. You got it down, Pat. Nice room you got here, Eddie. Yeah, I like it. 
But the boss really lives in class. Yeah, I bet. He's got a penthouse at the Park Lane. Must be doing all right, huh? Say, uh, Eddie. Huh? What's this big job everybody's so hepped up about? All I know is I got a soft spot here. I'm trying to be good to myself and clam up. Now, about this arm trick. Suppose a guy comes at you with a left. Wait a minute. Yeah? Yeah, it's me. What's that? Oh, you don't say. Sure, I'll take care of that little thing. That's my specialty. But what about... Uh, yeah, yeah. Don't worry, boss. Every minute. Yeah. What is it, Eddie? Something for us to do? No, Saunders. Just something for me to do. Oh, wait a minute now. Bigelow didn't put me on the payroll just to hang around like this. How about me coming along just for the ride? No, you stay here. But when I come back, I'll be with you every minute. That's a promise. <laughs> Brooks, you say Valentine didn't leave word for you in any of those places he told you? No, and I'm beginning to get worried, Lieutenant. I'll tell you what you do. Try Jigger Collins again. If there's still nothing, then we'll decide what to do next. Yes, miss. You live in number 76, don't you? Yeah, before this fire, I was the janitor. Well, have you seen Mr. Collins? No, and I ain't likely to. What do you mean? It was his room where the fire started, the poor man. What are you talking about? He was dead before anybody could get to him. The fire marshal said he must have fallen asleep with a lighted cigarette. Plain carelessness. But, but that couldn't have been it. Mr. Collins didn't smoke cigarettes, I know. Maybe it was a cigar then. But the way it ended was the same. The poor man. I went all through the files, Miss Brooks, when Lieutenant Riley called down here to the record room. Yes, Sergeant, what'd you find? Well, as far as we can tell, only this man here has been connected with Bigelow for any length of time. Huh? Well, let me see. Turner, Edward. Yeah, worst kind of a rat. Age 36, 1938 suspicion of arson, 1943 arson conviction, two years Folsom, 1946... That's his racket, Miss Brooks. Turner sets fire so nobody knows how they started. You know, for insurance and other reasons. Fire. That loft building. And now Jigger Collins. Huh? Then Bigelow must know about George. Well, I don't get your meaning, Mr. Oh, I've got to find a way to warn him. Paul, are you sure Mr. Valentine didn't leave some kind of message here at the cigar stand? I surely would have remembered it, Miss Brooks. Say, where's he been keeping himself anyway? Funny you ask me that, Miss Brooks. What do you mean, Marcus? Well, I was shot in Mr. Valentine's shoes. Yeah? I kind of felt he wanted to say something to me. But there was a big, heavy-set man with him, so he didn't say nothing. Well, go on, Marcus. Of course, I didn't call Mr. Valentine by his name, just like he told me. So nobody said nothing. Well, when did they leave? Couldn't have been more than 15 minutes ago. You know, Eddie, I like you. But there are times when a guy likes to be alone. I like you too, Saunders. I just want to be around in case you get into any trouble. Yeah. Come on, let's get upstairs to the room. Hey, incidentally, Eddie, what was the job Bigelow sent you on today? Oh, nothing much. Just gave a guy a hot foot all over. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I wasn't looking where I was going. Oh, that's all right, miss. No harm done. <laughs> oh, it was so clumsy. Oh, here, wait a minute. You dropped your pocketbook. Oh, thank you very much. Let's get going. Mm-hmm. Nice dish. 
Hey, Eddie, I could swear I saw her somewhere before. Skip it, Romeo. Let's get upstairs. As I said before, Eddie, uh... Fella likes a little privacy sometimes. Let's not go through that again. Well, it looks as though this is the only way I'm going to get it. Hey, what? Uh, I don't know. Hold you till I get you tied up. Come on now. Over with you, big boy. Hey. Hey, to get out of this, you'll have to be a Houdini. Hey, what? Hey. Now, let's see what we can find. Hey, here we're... What are you doing? I'm just giving you the once-over lightly, Eddie. Yeah. See what I can find that's interesting. Yeah. Who wised you up that we're on to you? Oh, just somebody I bumped into. Yeah. The bim down in the lobby, eh? That's wallet. Since when do you use foreign money? What is it to you? A whole lot. Yeah, a very fancy bit of currency. President of the Republic right in the middle, flanked by the whole cabinet, medals and all. Manuel Flores, Juan Aguinaldo, Ubaldo Perez, Ramon Cardoba, and company. Okay, Eddie, start talking. <laughs> you haven't forgotten Saunders' favorite persuader. Hey, wait. Only this time I'll break your arm. The stakes are that high. Take your hands off this me. This is a little souvenir you picked up, isn't it? Isn't this the money Bigelow is printing on that stolen paper? Eddie, don't force me to... Yeah, 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 that's the stuff. Oh, where is he making it? Come on, talk. In the, the basement of the building next to the... Paper company. You mean Estraida Candy Company? Where the fire was? Bigelow thought it would be the safest place. Holy Moses, now it gels. Bigelow had that fire started. That's how he heisted the paper. Hello, operator. Let me have police headquarters. Couldn't wait till you got here, Valentine. Oh, darling, it's so good to see you. I was so afraid that gorilla with you saw me slip you that nose. Say, so what about Bigelow and the others, Lieutenant? Well, this is just how we found the place. Empty. Oh, you can't say they didn't work fast once they found out about me. Oh, I call Martin Kirsch. He'll be over here in a minute. This isn't going to make him very happy. Miss Brooks told me what this deal is all about, so I put out a general alarm for Bigelow. Yeah, he won't waste a minute trying to get out of the country with all that money. What was that in your note about Collins, Brooksy? Well, he's dead, huh? George. There was a fire in his rooming house. He was murdered. It was Eddie Turner at his best. So that's what he meant, the hot foot all over. Lieutenant Turner is all bundled up waiting for you at the hotel. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Send the car over to the Claremont. Bring Eddie Turner in. Well, you did a good job on this case, Valentine. You got a tough break, but don't worry about Bigelow. We'll pick him up sooner or later. I wasn't particularly thinking of Bigelow. What do you yeah? mean, George? Good work, Valentine. I understand you traced the paper to the men who stole it. Yeah, Mr. Kirsch. And to think it was right here, next door, all the time. I'm Lieutenant Riley, Mr. Kirsch. There's just one hitch. Hitch? Yes. Take a look at these uh, strips of paper here next to the press. Yes. Yes, that's our paper, all right. That's all that's left of the two reams, Mr. Kirsch. You mean they already printed the money? They have it uh, with them, wherever they are. I, I'd better sit down. I'm afraid we won't have time for that. Uh, meaning what? I gathered from Eddie Turner that the boss lived at the Park Lane. You don't think he's still there, do you? We'll see when we get there, Brooksy. But I think you'd better come along with us, Mr. Kirsch. <laughs> Oh, well, there's only one penthouse here at the Park Lane, isn't it, Clerk? Uh, uh, that's right, sir. Thanks, that's all I want to know. Uh, who shall I say is calling? I really must announce Relax, you, friends, relax. This is the police. And you can let me have the pass key. Really, Valentine, I wish you'd tell us why you brought us here at all. I don't understand it. It won't do any good now. Well, we can't just give up, Mr. Kirk. Here we are. Huh? What was it? Hey. Oh, that, that was a shot. Nice kissing, Mr. Kirsch. Miss Brooks, you better stay back with Mr. Kirsch. Well, knocked himself off, whoever he is. Yeah. Did a good job of it, too. Who is he, Valentine? Do you know him? His name's Obaldo. Uh, who? 
Obaldo Perez. How do you know who he is, George? Look, the money. Scattered all over the desk. That's the stuff Bigelow turned out. What in the name of heaven is this? Those half-packed bags should speak for themselves, Lieutenant. Well, this, this Perez, where does he fit in? Eddie Turner said the boss lived here at the Park Lane. What? Well, you're looking at him right now. But Bigelow was... Here, a... take a look at one of these bills. Thank goodness they're here. When I think what would have happened... If... Uh, just a minute, Mr. Kirk. Huh? What about this bill, Valentine? Lieutenant, there in the center of the picture is the President of the Republic. Yeah. With all the members of his cabinet. Now, take a good look at the third man from the left, the Secretary of War. Uh, let me see. That would be General Ubaldo Perez, the boss. George, that Perez was such a little man to have such a big, fantastic scheme. Well, Napoleon was a little man, Angel. And Hitler was no giant. Yeah, but I still don't quite understand how he expected to pull it off. Well, it's not as complicated as it sounds. Perez was an exile for being overambitious. If his country were suddenly flooded with all this new money, well, there was bound to be a panic. In all the confusion, Ubaldo and his followers planned to step into power. Oh. You know, George, I almost wish the clerk hadn't called up and announced us. I would have loved to meet a fabulous character like that. Uh-huh. Don't be romantic, Brooksy. He was cornered, and he made the grand gesture, that's all. Hmm. Oh, yes, darling, I spoke to Mr. Kirsch. Huh? He promised to make a very special kind of paper for my wedding invitations when I get married. The kind of paper nobody could possibly reproduce. <laughs> you don't say. Oh, he's so grateful to us. He promised to work in all kinds of tricky watermarks, that's Cupid's true. arrows, lover's knots, things like that. That's very nice. Doesn't that thrill you? No. <laughs> It'd thrill me more if he gave you two reams of paper they print negotiable bonds on. Oh, you're mercenary. Oh, oh, I wouldn't make a pig of myself, Angel. I wouldn't turn out a single bond after I reached a nice round billion dollars. Do you know why marching soldiers break step when crossing a bridge? To counteract the weight and force that comes from marching in rhythm. Atlas Tire engineers use the same principle to give you quiet running tires. By changing the frequency of brakes in the tread, they got rid of the hum. And quieter, smoother riding comfort is only one of the advantages you get with Atlas Tires. Seventy to eighty different compounds go into an Atlas Tire for improved heat resistance, more mileage. Its deeper grooves and non-skid edges give you greater safety, too. Quick, straight stops, and it's a tire that sits right down on the turns. Also, with Atlas Passenger Tires, you get a written warranty. A warranty that's good at 38,000 Atlas dealers seven days a week. So to give yourself safer driving with more comfort and more mileage, get grip-safe Atlas Tires. Get them at your standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Hello, George. Yeah, Brooksy? Well, I've only a minute to talk. I made an excuse to get away from Eric for just a moment. Yeah, go on. Eric just told me he gets $1,250 every month. The exact amount Dr. Penford draws out of the bank. Yes, but... Well, why would the son be blackmailing his own father? If I can find out the answer to that, Angel, I'll know who wrote that note to Dr. Penford. And maybe prevent a murder. Adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Herbert Butterfield as Martin Kirsch, Joe Forte as Big Low, Eddie Fields as Ubaldo. Clayton Post as Eddie, and Charlie Lung as Jigger. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, 
Same time, same station to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Welcome back. I've actually heard the next one. I'm still going to play it. It was a, a really uh, a great one. I heard that one over on Antioch, and you're going to really enjoy it. I think. I was kind of almost. I was almost suspecting the uh, the client uh, when he insisted the client gum with him to the uh, uh, to the penthouse, but uh, it turned out not to be. I, I wonder why they insisted on him coming then. All right, I have one more comment on Podcast Island before we wrap up the show. A very enjoyable podcast, unique in bringing serial detectives in their original broadcast order. Interesting, opinionated commentary. Keep it up. And thank you for the comment, and we definitely will. I will go ahead and I'll announce our next movie will be The Woman in Green. It's the second of four of the Rathbone Bruce Sherlock Holmes movies uh, that have escaped into the public domain. Uh, so we are going to go ahead, and the next movie will be The Woman in Green, and that will be posted April 11th. All right, well, uh, we're going to get into uh, this week's episode of Sherlock Holmes. Before we do, I do want to briefly remind you about Netflix. Netflix uh, provides you access to all sorts of Holmes movies. Uh, from a wide variety of eras, including the very popular ITV version with Jeremy Brett uh, on its instant watch. Uh, you can try Netflix free for two weeks and see if you can br- see how much homes you can bring into your home. Go to greatdetectives.net, click on the Netflix banner uh, on the right-hand side, uh, but, uh, or go to netflix.greatdetectives.net. Now we're going to get into today's episode of Sherlock Holmes. This one is called The Paradol Chamber. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rabin and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... I invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Of course, I can't be as entertaining as Dr. Watson, but I can tell you something that's really worth knowing. Simply this. The best beginning a good meal ever had is a glass of Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is the perfect before-dinner wine. While you're waiting for dinner to be put on the table, pour yourself a glass of that clear, amber-colored Petri Sherry. Now, just sit back and sip it slowly. Take your time so you can thoroughly enjoy every single drop of that wonderful Petri flavor. And what a flavor that sherry has. Comes right from the sun-ripened heart of wonderful California grapes. Now, you may be a real wine expert and know all about sherry wine, but believe me, until you've tried Petri sherry, you're really missing something, no kidding. Serve Petri sherry alone or serve it with canopies or appetizers. And by all means, serve it proudly. You can because the letters P-E-T-R-I... Spell the proudest name in the history of American wines. Petri. And now for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. Let's see if he's expecting us. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, good evening, Doctor. Uh, good evening, Mr. Campbell. It's about time you got here. Draw up a chair and make yourself comfortable. Oh, thanks. Well, you have the old black dispatch box out again, I see. I suppose you've been going over your notes on tonight's venture. <laughs> yeah, that's right, my boy. And this may interest you. Mrs. Watson figured prominently in the story. She did? Yes, in fact, if it hadn't been for some remarkably quick thinking on her part, Holmes and I might have... Uh, <laughs> well, there I go again, telling you the end of the story before I forget it. Well, uh, how did it begin, Doctor? On a winter evening in 1887... I've been married some months, and in consequence, I haven't seen much of my old friend Sherlock Holmes. Oh, well, you're still living at Baker Street, I suppose. Yes, my boy, but we couldn't persuade him to come around and see us. From time to time, I'd heard some vague accounts of his doings, of his summons to Odessa, in the case of the Trepoff murder, and of his clearing up the singular tragedy of the Atkinson brothers. But to, uh, to get back 
Tonight's story. My wife and I had just finished an excellent dinner. I remember had set ourselves down for an evening of pleasant domesticity. She was stitching away on a piece of extra petit pois, and I was at my desk balancing figures in the family account book. After a few moments, my wife looked up to me and said, John, dear, don't look so troubled. Oh, was I looking troubled? Well, you've been scowling at that account book for ten minutes now. What's the matter, dear? Don't the figures add up correctly? Oh, yes, yes, they add up correctly. In fact, they tell a very pretty story. After buying my practice and setting up all my outstanding accounts, I find that we have nearly a hundred and fifty pounds left of the diary that Mr. Sholto settled upon you. A hundred and sixty, isn't it, dear? I was doing the same sum this morning. Oh, well, 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 but perhaps it is a hundred and sixty. In any case, Mary, dear, the point I was going to make is that we, we don't need the money just now. My practice is picking up splendidly, and I was thinking that we might, uh, might invest it in something really sound, of course. Who's been talking to you, John? Dr. Wilson again. Well, uh, as it happens, I did bump into him at the hospital today. He can put us onto something very good in Peruvian silver. Uh, what do you think of the idea? Well, John, the, the fact is, I'd almost decided to make a business investment with it myself. I thought I'd surprise you. Well, uh, now, now uh, let me tell uh, you about uh, it, John. Oh. Yesterday, when you were out on your rounds, yes. a most charming man called here. Oh, and it is Ted Barber. He introduced himself as a friend of Mrs. Stephen Forrester. Oh, yeah. He said he was certain we'd be interested in his new company. And he talked so convincingly that, well, uh, I'm afraid I almost promised him I'd buy some stock in the company. Oh, did you really? What, what, uh, what sort of company is it? Well, I didn't quite understand that part of it. But it sounds wonderful. He left a prospectus. It's in the right-hand drawer of the desk. It's uh, something to do with a wonderful new metal that's been discovered by an American chemist called Paradel or Paradis or something. Oh, well, let's have a look at what it says. A company formed to exploit the amazing new metal discovered by Dr. Paradis. Paradol preferred stock. The potentialities of this new alloy are measurable. The fourth dimension has been conquered. What? I feel dislocation is an accomplished fact. Oh, gracious me, my dear child, this prospectus is absolute poppycock. Now, John, you mustn't be stubborn. Well, I think at least we should investigate it. The man said that if we went to the laboratories, Dr. Paradis would give us a demonstration himself. But, Mary dear, Mary dear, the fourth dimension, I mean to say, it's obviously fraud. That's what everyone says when a new invention comes out. But this might be an opportunity for us to make a lot of money, John. Mary, I do wish you... To please me, dear? Well, I can't argue with you for very long, Mary. All right, all right. I'll take you to the laboratory in the morning, but I warn you, I'll show this Dr. Paradis up for the charlatan that he is. Uh, Dr. Paradis will be with you both in a moment. Well, thank you, my man. She's just concluding an experiment. She? Dr. Paradis is a woman, then? Oh, yes, madam, and a very brilliant one, too. Excuse me. Oh, it's the last straw. The whole thing sounded like an obvious fraud, and now we get here and there are woman doctors at the back of the door. Just because she's a woman, it doesn't mean to say that... How do you do? I'm Dr. Paradis. Oh, how do you do, madam? I'm Dr. Watson, and this is my wife, Mrs. Watson. Oh, yes. Come into the laboratory, won't you? Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Paradis. Well, we're just wasting your time. We're not really interested in this at all, you know. John, feel... don't mutter. Well, Mr. We... Barber told me that he had called on you, Mrs. Watson, and that you were very interested in my invention. Oh, yes, I am. That's why I persuaded my husband to come down with me and see a demonstration. I'll be most happy to show you everything I can. Here's a practical example of the application of my work. This chamber you see in front of you is made completely of my new alloy. Well, what's the thing do? It's just a great metal box with a lot of dials and switches and things. Why is it so big? Do, <laughs> do people get inside it? They can. What? Though if they do, they're liable to find themselves transported many miles from here. Good Come goodness. inside, won't you? Oh, what a lot of nonsense. Now, John. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm giving a demonstration. I want you both to see that there is no exit from inside this chamber. No trap doors or anything. The only exit is the door we just came through. Yes, it's just like an airtight metal room. Stuff in here, isn't it? Now let's go outside again. I'll show you how the machine operates. Albert! Uh, yes, Dr. Paradis. I'm going to demonstrate the Paradol chamber to Dr. and Mrs. Watson. Oh, very well. Uh, the usual time? Yes, please, Albert. Now, my assistant goes inside the chamber. 
I closed this metal door on him, so. What are you going to do with him? Within a matter of seconds, he will be seven miles from here. <laughs> Is there really, madam? You Please, can't Dr. expect Watson, us to believe You're a scientific man. <laughs> At least give me the opportunity of demonstrating my work. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now, I adjust these dials, turn on the electrical generator, and... Good Lord, what an amazing business. Now open the door, Dr. Watson, and look inside, please. Great Scott, he's gone. I don't believe it. Dr. Paradise, will you explain this to me? Gladly. My metal paradol is an unnatural alloy. What? It causes a dislocation in the warp of space and enables us to enter the fourth dimension. <laughs> you see, time <laughs> is a dimension. Any object in the past, present, or future can be described precisely in three dimensions of space and one of time. Yes, but this machine of yours... Uh... The alloy of paradol, combined with the great forces of electricity, has created a new force. This element is controlled by these dials, and it is possible to move in four dimensions at once. Thus, bodies or other objects can be transported great distances away, all in the twinkling of an eye. I coined the word to describe the process. Teleportation, I call it. Teleportation? Well, I'm completely confused. All my scientific training tells me this is impossible, and yet, uh, uh, I wonder if you'd give us another demonstration. Certainly. Perhaps you yourself would like to be teleported somewhere. Certainly not. Good gracious, we uh, know. No, no, I, I think John anyway. would be very unhappy in the fourth dimension. He wouldn't belong. Yes, you, you, you said that any objects could be moved. How about that brown paper parcel on the table over there? Certainly. It only contains some company circulars. I suggest you write your initials on it so that you identify it later. Oh, very well. J-H-W. There you are. Where do you want it dispatched to? Send it to my house. I'll give you the address. That won't be necessary. Man, this is, this is an amazing business. Isn't it, John? Exciting, too. There we are. Now I adjust the dials once more and... <laughs> Parcel is already at your house. Oh, it's impossible. Come along, Mary. Let's get a cab and race back there as fast as we can. Well, yes, goodbye, yes. Doctor. Good, goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye. Bye. Now, dear. John, you must admit you're just as excited as I am. Well, I confess that I'm enormously intrigued. Let me just get my, my latch front door gear. Here we are. It's tough to parody. This is a devilishly clever woman. Even so, my intelligence tells me... It's impossible for the package to have reached here before us. Ah, here we are. Ah, oh, there you are, Master. Mum, just in time for lunch. Tell me, Annie, did the package arrive for us? Oh, yes, it did, Mum. I put it on our table. Great Damn Scott. Uh, how was it delivered, Annie? Well, now, that's the funny thing about it, sir. I don't know. I went out to polish the bra on the door knocker a few minutes ago, and there was the parson lying on the doorstep. No one had rung the bell or anything. I didn't know how it got there. Thank you, Annie. You, you can go now. Yes, Mum. Well, John, what do you say now? There's a miracle's been performed. I don't believe my eyes. Look, there are my initials on the package. Mary, I think that if you don't mind, after lunch, I'll... You'll go around to Baker Street and tell Stella Holmes about this. Oh, do you mind, dear? Of course not, dear. Good. It'll be nice to see Holmes again anyway. <laughs> Dr. Watson, how nice to see you again. Hello, Mrs. Hudson. How are you, my dear? Oh, I'm just fine. So you're looking grand, sir. Marriage agrees with you, oh, if you don't you. mind my saying so. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Is, uh, is Mr. Holmes in? Aye, sir. And I'm very glad you're seeing him. He's no been act like himself lately. Oh, really? Locking his door. And only unlocking it for me when I give him a, a, a password. And he's hardly touched his food for the last three days. Tell you the truth, Dr. Watson, I'm awful worried about him. Well, well, I'll go up to him. He'll be glad to see you, I'm sure. Yes? Who is it? It's me, Watson. Watson? Oh, possibly. I'm not taking any chances. Holmes, this is ridiculous. Surely you know my voice after all these years? John H. Watson. Tell me what your middle initial stands for, and I'll let you in. It stands for Hamish. What, my dear fellow? How are you? I'm fine, and delighted to see you again, Holmes. Uh, incidentally, why all this rigmarole about locked doors 
Impossible. Well, uh, Professor Mariotti has decided that it's high time to settle his score with me. There have been several attempts on my life lately. Twice I've been attacked in the streets, and only yesterday a shot was fired at me through the uh, window you see broken there. Lord Holmes, you must be careful. I am being very careful. That's why I indulge in what you refer to as all this rigmarole. But, uh, well, enough of my problems. What's on your mind? There's a sparkle in your eye and an air of excitement that tells me that you've uh, some news to impart. Well, I, I must say there is something. Of course there is, my dear fellow. Come on, tell me about it. You ever hear of a new metal called Paradol and its inventor, Dr. Paradis? Oh, yes, yes, indeed I have. I received a prospectus concerning it the other day. Well, uh, what, uh, what do you think of the idea? Oh, obviously it's rubbish designed to fool a gullible public into buying shares. Don't tell me that, uh... You were taking it, Oh, right? no, 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 of course not, Holmes. Naturally, as a scientific man, I knew it was rubbish. My, uh, my wife, however, had a couple of involved in the concern. And so today, to prove to her that the whole thing was a fraud, we went down to the laboratory and met this Dr. Paradis. Oh, did you indeed? In the first place, let me tell you, this Dr. Paradis <laughs> is a woman. Oh, a woman? As you can imagine, I didn't have any difficulty in discrediting <laughs> her theories. In fact, I'm afraid I... I made her seem rather stupid. <laughs> However, we did stay there long enough for her to, to give us a demonstration. And that's the way that it was, Holmes. When we got back to our house, the initial package was there, waiting for us. Oh, childish trick. Obviously, the paradox here contains an ingeniously hidden trap door, through which the assistant disappeared and later the package. A fast cab then took it to your home before you could get there. Oh, yes, oh, really? Well, uh, yes, yes, of course, that's exactly how I explained the thing to Mary. Was she impressed with the feet? Yes, she was. Uh, but you know how women are. I tried to tell her the whole thing was a fraud. She's uh, very obstinate. I was hoping perhaps that you will help me expose the concern. Oh, hardly seem necessary, old fellow. Such an obvious fraud. However, for your sake, I'll be glad to do anything I can. Well, I thought we might go down to the laboratory late tonight when nobody's there. Take a look at that paradox chamber a little more closely. Yes, a good idea. After being cooped up here for three days, it'll be a pleasure to get some night air and indulge in a little simple burglarizing. Well, shall I call for you here? No, no, wait a minute, dear fellow. It's much too dangerous. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll be in a handsome cab outside your house about 11.30 tonight. How's that? Splendid. Quite like old times, isn't it, Holmes? Yes, it is, old chap, though I think that uh, this time, for Mrs. Watson's sake, I must try and keep you out of trouble. Yes, Watson. Time to only concerned old bachelors like myself should be wandering the streets of London. Oh, rubbish, Holmes. You talk as if Mary was a tyrant. Now, don't get angry, well, you, old chap. I was only being well, suspicious. Well, is this, um, hmm? Dr. Paradis' laboratory? Yes. Yeah. I'd like to be seen. I don't imagine it'll be very hard to break in, though. Strike a match, will you? I took the precaution of bringing this lantern. There you are. Thanks, old fellow. Is the, is the door locked? Yes, but I think the skeleton key will do the trick. Hold this lantern for a second, will you? Yeah. Oh, oh, this is a chance play so far. Come on. Yeah. There's the, the paradox chamber over there. Uh -huh. Give me the lantern again, old chap, will you? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Quite an elaborate collection. The door's been left open. Let's go in and take a look at the inside of it. Ah, not both of us, Watson. If this is the only entrance and... Uh, the two of us walked in. It'd be too easy to slam the door shut on us. No, I suppose so. You go in and I'll keep watch out here. All right. Oh, why, um, trust that in a few minutes I won't find myself lying on your doorstep. Holmes, there are times when your sense of humor is a little strained. Holmes! Holmes, you all right? Watson! What is it, Holmes? The body of a dead woman. She's been shot. Unless I'm much mistaken. Let me come and look. A thousand to one is Dr. Paradis. Yes, yes, it is. Watson, get out of here. Don't you the... Good Lord, someone has slammed the show of the door. Shut on us. Yes, my dear fellow. We walked into a trap very neatly. I'm afraid that we're imprisoned in what appears to be an airtight metal chamber, and the only person who can help us to get out of it again is a corpse. <laughs> Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds. It's time for me to remind you that good food always tastes better when served together with good wine. 
Did you know that Petri makes two wonderful mealtime wines? Wines especially made to go with food? Well, they do. Petri California Burgundy and Petri California Sauterne. You want a rich, hearty red wine, wine that's great with any meat or meat dish, you just try Petri Burgundy. And if you want a wine that's perfect with chicken or fish, try a delicate golden-colored Petri Sauterne. Petri Burgundy if you want a red wine, Petri Sauterne if you want white. But always a Petri wine if you want a good wine. Now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. It is in the early hours of a winter's morning in 1887. The famous pair, while investigating the mysteries of a scientific laboratory in the east end of London, have been trapped in an airtight metal cabinet, their only companion being the dead body of a woman scientist. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes and his old friend Dr. Watson are listening intently as footsteps approach what appears to be their metal coffin. There's someone outside. There's slide back the mental tunnel. Good evening, gentlemen. That voice. It's Dr. Perry's assistant. Let us out of here. Or should I be more precise, Mr. Holmes, and say good morning? <laughs> Hello, Moriarty. Moriarty, you scoundrel. I can just get my hands on him. Dr. Watson, I wish you could get over your dislike for me. For my own part, I'm genuinely sorry that my trap had to catch you, too. I've often felt unhappy that you're not on my side. Such slavish admiration of you, given your friend Sherlock Holmes, must be highly gratified. There's never mind about all that. What are you up to? It's obvious, my dear Watson. The whole scheme was a plan to lure me out of my safe hiding by presenting an intriguing problem, and one that victimized the wife of my old friend. You knew it would get back to my ears, didn't you, Moriarty? <laughs> yes, exactly. But why did you murder this Paradise woman? That's uh, equally obvious, my dear Watson. It served her purpose in presenting a most convincing scientific front. As soon as the fact was baited, it was a liability. She might tell tales, and so she was killed. Like so many other of your accomplices, my dear professor. Ah, uh, precisely. Now, my dear fellows, I'm afraid that I must close this panel and say goodbye. Quite solid, I have to kill you, but you're becoming dreadfully in my way. And how do you plan to kill us, my auntie? By doing nothing more than closing this panel. Oh, I could be frightfully dramatic and release deadly gases into the chamber, or poisonous snakes, or something equally colorful. But quite frankly, it seems so much simpler just to cut you in. Our oxygen supply won't last very long, you know. And for your benefit, Dr. Watson, I may tell you that Peridol, whatever its other shortcomings as a metal, is bulletproof. Goodbye, you meddling fool! Oh. There uh, seems nothing for us to do but look around and ascertain our chances of escape. Holmes, I don't like this. We're in a very nasty situation. My dear Watson, sometimes you're a master of understatement. Uh-huh. Just as I thought. What have you found, Holmes? Sliding panel. Just behind the dead woman. Yeah. It leads to a passageway. A passageway that has been bricked up only within the last few hours. But long enough, I'm afraid, to make it impossible. No, there's no escape here. Hold the lantern a little higher, will you, Walter? Yeah. That's it. Well, what are we going to do now? I was just estimating the cubic capacity of this chamber. The air supply should last comfortably for at least another eight hours. I recommend a brief sleep to refresh us and also to conserve our oxygen supply. Sleep? Who could sleep at a time like this? I can and you can, old chap, if you discipline yourself. Well, well I'll try, Holmes, but I know perfectly well I shan't close my eyes. Wake up, Watson, wake up. Oh, uh, yes, my dear. Oh, 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 is it you? Oh, we're still in this infernal trap. I'm afraid so, old chap. Uh, what time? Just after seven in the morning. Uh, how long did you estimate our oxygen supply would last? Probably about another hour. Well, it's just possible that some worker will come to the laboratory early and let us out. I shouldn't count too much on that if I were you. Oh, I suppose not. I say, Holmes, I'm, I'm famished. Yes, I thought you would be, my dear chap. So I saved you a, this half of a bar of chocolate. I ate my own share just before you awakened. Oh, thanks, my dear fellow. Uh, did, did you sleep too, no. Holmes? No, I didn't, Watson. I employed my time in conducting a minute examination of this chamber. I was trying to find some possible way of getting out. And you failed, eh? I'm afraid so. Holmes, this looks like the end, doesn't it? Well, if it is my time to die, I'm glad that we're together again. 
Although I blame myself entirely for, for letting you into oh, the town. Come now, my dear fellow. Don't take it as badly as that. But you admitted you're defeated and that there's no possible way out to this district. I meant that there's no way out from the inside. So my plan worked. Good gracious me. What on earth? The star. The star. There you are. Mary. Mary, you dear little... You, you must have been frightened to death. Hello, John. Oh, dear, you must have been a miserable night. Well, 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 well. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson have been getting themselves in trouble again, eh? Sir, this is no time for your heavy-handed badinage. There's the body of a murdered woman inside that chamber. She was killed by Professor Moriarty. Professor Moriarty? I'll you to get my message sooner. Your message? Oh, bless my soul, Holmes. I wish you'd tell me how you got your message to Scotland Yard. Well, ever since these recent attacks on my life, I've had, uh... My delightful band of ragamuffins, the Baker Street Irregulars, watching my house fixed watches, two at a time. I gave the boys instructions to follow me whenever I went out. And if ever I did not reappear within three hours, they were to report to our friend Lestrade at Scotland Yard. Holmes, you're amazing. You, you, you think of everything. Just a minute, gentlemen, just a minute. I didn't get no message from any of your Baker Street Irregulars. Oh, you didn't? No, sir. Though I did find a couple of the boys tied up when we came in here just but now. if you didn't get a message from them, how did you come here so opportunely? <laughs> That's an easy one, because Mrs. Watson here came and fetched me. You did, Mary, but how on earth... <laughs> Go on, Mom. Well, tell them. Well, it's really very simple. When John came back from seeing you yesterday, Mr. Holmes, he was over elaborately casual in his references to the Peridol chamber. So, of course, I knew at once the two of you were going to investigate the matter. I also caught him oiling his revolver after dinner. I didn't know that you slipped out last night, John. But as soon as I woke up this morning, I realized what had happened. So I went straight to Scotland Yard for Inspector Lestrade and brought him here with me. Why, Mary, you clever little thing. Isn't she a clever darling, Holmes? Uh, Mrs. Watson, this has been a, a salutary experience. Uh, will you allow me to congratulate you on your deductive ability? Well, that's very nice of you, Mr. Holmes, but I really don't deserve any compliments. If you don't mind my saying so, it was elementary, my dear Mr. Holmes. Elementary. This is Bob Campbell saying good night for the Petri family. This program comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, a nice little bit of humor from uh, Sherlock Holmes. I I like that the part that where where Watson said he didn't care for it. I actually thought that was pretty funny. It's kind of an interesting out for this episode. Um, almost a um, a reminder of the importance of taking women uh, seriously, as. Um, uh, Dr. Watson learned, as well as uh, Sherlock Holmes being reminded. Uh, to be honest, for the first half of the uh, story, it had kind of a sci-fi plot, almost. Uh, the one thing you notice about this about this show, the way it's told, is they've got an incredible uh, lot of uh, flexibility. Uh, it's not television where you have to do makeup. Um, so they can move freely about the Sherlock Holmes era. So thus, this week's episode was about was a little less than thirty years prior to last week's episode, um, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of timing. I have an email here from Richard where he uh, pointed me to a Sherlock Holmes radio show he'd mentioned uh, appear now on BBC Radio Seven. Um, and, uh, he said he had a question, he said, I want to, recently heard the name Harry Bartell as an actor in an old, another old time radio show. I take it, uh, he was more than just a spokesman for Petri Wine, but do you know anything about him or what he was in? I do. And I'll actually save that for next week, just because we're st- going to be starting the Harry Bartell era. Uh, on Sherlock Holmes. He then had a Superman episode, which I'll, a question which I'll answer on Sunday. He says, finally, uh, Johnny Madero, how did they not get sued by the makers of Pat Novak? Because if you change the names, names of the characters, it's the same show, even more so than CSI, CSI Miami, CSI New York, uh, puts in parentheses CSI Boise. Um, I think the, the main reason they didn't get sued is it costs money to uh, go through a lawsuit. Uh, and for ABC, 
Um, it really wasn't worth it. ABC hadn't even, uh, ABC, which owned Pat Novak, they hadn't even taken the show national. Um, so they basically got some concessions for Mutual, and then they just decided to let it go. Because you also have the risk that if you lose, uh, then you've given a lot of free publicity to uh, Johnny Madero. Uh, people are reading the papers about, AB, about ABC suing Mutual. Um, so I, I think they just decided that discretion, the better part of valor, and uh, just to go ahead, and they made a, uh, Mutual made a couple changes, so it wasn't an exact and complete clone, and uh, they just decided to drop it. Comment from Susan, uh, um, regarding my big list of detective old-time radio shows, she said that she's also in favor of Casey Crime Photographer. I'm sure you knew it has a few other titles as well. Uh, you said today that it helps you to have listener comments. There are a few others under the same category that I also like, but I'm very groggy at the moment, and to make sure I don't mix up the titles before I say which one. I'll let you know which I like later if you want. Thanks for the great job you do. Well, thanks, and uh, it helps. Uh, just as I'm making decisions about which ones I'm going to try out, I'm getting a lot of comments for, uh, for Casey, so I'm definitely going to take a listen to it. Um, and yeah, there there were quite a few different names. I know there was Flash, uh, uh, there was uh, Flash Gun Casey, and um, a bunch of different ones we we get to into if we host the show. Um, one thing I have to say, I was just looking over at archive.org and taking a look at their uh, at the old time radio uh, researchers, uh, Casey Crime photographer uh, their. Uh, certified accurate collection, which is uh, uh, pretty well accurate for uh, any of the um, best collection of the shows. Uh, and they had uh, 75 episodes, but all of these episodes look sound like they're really high sound quality. So if we go with that, uh, because most of the shows we do are about 30, you know, the... Um, 32 kbps uh, is the normal for shows we up uh, shows that we have as our basic. Uh, most of the Casey episodes they had were about a 128. They had a few that were 164 and just a couple that were 32. So uh, I would definitely, I'll definitely be interested if the sound quality is that good. Uh, can definitely make a, a nice listening experience even better. Uh, I will be uh, copying those over and listening to them all. Generally, I what I do with shows is I'll listen to four episodes, kind of get a feel for it with a show as long as Casey. Um, so I'll listen to the first episode with the main star. There was one episode done like in 1943, but that's the only one we have with that guy, so that doesn't tell us a whole lot about that series. Um, so I'll listen to the first episode with him, and then if you're a fan and you've got a, a particular episode in mind that you think would be, this is a great example of what uh, Casey Crumb Photographer is all about, uh, then let me know and I will, at, uh, and I will try to uh, get that added. So uh, I'll look forward to hearing that. All right, uh, two comments from Podcast Alley. I really like this podcast. Great that it is updated daily when other old-time radio podcasters are up, only updated infrequently. Great work, Adam. Keep it up. Um, and thanks for the comment. I know podcasting, uh, doing this thing regularly, particularly when I started, was kind of um, unprecedented with any type of podcast. Uh, the general schedule for podcasting used to be, well, I post a new episode whenever. Uh, uh, that's changing a little bit on uh, some other shows, but glad to be able to provide the regular old-time radio. And then Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio Podcast is the greatest. Well, thank you so much. At Radio Detectives. All right, well, we have got uh, several comments to get into. We'll start off with Lori, who says regarding the bad, our last movie, uh, Lori says, it kept me guessing until the end. Keep the movies coming, Adam. They're great. Well, I appreciate the feedback on the movies. All right, well, um, we're going to go ahead and get into today's episode of Yours Truly, Donnie Dollar, in just a second. Uh, before we do, I want to remind you, um, in this episode, Johnny Dollar goes and tra uh, goes and travels. I remind you, but as you prepare to travel, remember to uh, check out uh, Priceline.com. Go to GreatDetectives.net. Click on the Priceline link, 
and we have a, a special de- uh, deal on hotels. If you book a uh, Name Your Own Price Hotel on Priceline for a two-star or better hotel, and you find a better publicly available price excluding taxes and fees on another website for the same hotel and dates, just call Priceline. And if you qualify, they'll refund 100% of the difference uh, between what you found on the other side and give you a $25 refund on your credit card. Uh, In addition, for customers with a U.S. billing address, they'll give you a coupon for $50 off your next purchase of a two-night or longer Priceline vacation package. Time on this deal is limited, so go to greatdetectives.net, click the link. Well, today's episode is called the Melanie Carter Matter. Uh, this one takes us back to Boston, so let's go ahead and take a listen to the Melanie Carter matter, also called in some places the Unnice Niece. We'll listen, and then we'll come back. The most popular sport on Boston's Charles River is rowing in one-man skulls. Or rather, it was the most popular sport, that is, until they took the beating on one man's skull. Mine. <laughs> This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. (laughs) Expense account submitted by special investigator, Johnny Dollar. To Miss Melanie Carter, Pinckney Street... Beacon Hill, Boston. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during assignment as your representative, investigating list of your relatives who might be interested in murdering you for your insurance. Or, who'd like to rock the old doll to sleep? Or, the unnice niece and the charming young rat who put the few in the word nephew. Expense account item one. $5.98. Airfare, Hartford to Boston. Item two, three and a quarter. Cab fare, Logan Airport to your residence on Beacon Hill. Who is it? Uh, this is Mr. Dollar, the insurance man from Hartford. Good, good. Just a minute. Come in. Come in. An electric latch unlocked the door of your flat, and I stepped through, straight out of this century into the last. It was another world, the remnants of which you see today in antique shops, including those Chinese wind chimes that tinkled over by the window. And you, its tiny and aged queen, sat across the 19th century room in your modern throne, that chromium and black leather wheelchair. Come in. Come in, Mr. Darling. Oh. oh, what's what's the matter, ma'am? Oh, nothing, nothing. You just remind me of someone I once knew, that's all. Uh-huh. He was so... He... Come sit down over here. Thank you, Miss Carter. Uh, I take it you are Miss Carter. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. You probably expected a younger woman. <laughs> Maybe, but certainly not one any more attractive. You hold on to that gallantry of yours, young man. It's very difficult to find these days. And a very precious treasure to women. Uh, Miss Carter, since you seem to know my name, I guess there's not much use in my telling you that I'm the investigator recommended by your insurance company, Royal Life. Oh, yes. They sent me a telegram saying you would be here. No telephone? No. No telephone. You see, Mr. Dollar, I was once a very happy young lady. Yesterday was very good to me. Today and tomorrow, who knows? And why take chances? What little life I have left, I want to enjoy. That is why I've sent for you. You mean somebody tells you I was an early American insurance investigator? No, no, my dear. Just that experience is such a good teacher. Mr. Dollar, Mm -hmm. many years ago, my husband was murdered for his insurance money by his very own brother. Mm. Would you hand me my smelling salts, please? Yes, certainly. There you are. Old Fate was very quick in passing judgment on the case. 
because the brother was killed by a runaway horse as he was leaving the scene of his terrible crime. I not only received my half of the insurance money, but also the half that would someday have gone to him. Oh, and now you feel that your life may be in danger for the same reason. Oh, well, whether my life is actually in danger is not the most important thing. It is my mind that is in danger. The beneficiaries to all of my insurance, and as the company may have told you, it is a lot of insurance, are my niece and my nephew, the children of that murderer. You see, I adopted them after their father's death. Oh... Bad blood is bad blood, Mr. Dollar. And I want you to make sure that, that I am not engulfed by it. So, with the two names and addresses you gave me, written in your precise copperplate handwriting, I set out to give the once-over lightly to the two people you were afraid might someday give you a once-over not-so-lightly. Move number one. A quick trip up the financial pathways worn bare by credit bureaus, income tax investigators, and other types of snoops. I learned that thanks to your generosity, both your niece and your nephew had just enough to live graciously on, and uh, thanks to your frugality, no more. Move number two. A quick trip to Cambridge, the address of your nephew, Chalmers Carter. A stylish fire trap near Harvard Square. A maid let me in and summoned her mistress. Her entrance was announced by the jangling of a stack of bracelets and bangles running up her arm. So sorry to keep you waiting, darling. What was it you wanted? <clears throat> uh, how do you do? Uh, Mrs. Carter? I am. And I'm Crystal Carter. Of course. Oh, I say that's a beautiful suit you're wearing. Not Boston, I can tell. No, New York. $185, right off the racks. Uh, Mrs. Carter, the maid tells me your husband isn't at home. I oh, know. He isn't. Well, when do you expect him back? He always calls me before he comes. Why? I want to talk to him. That's why. Business, you know, that old stuff. Oh, business. Who can have any fun business? Hmm? Who are you, anyway? Sit down. I'm a guy who suddenly knows what the old-fashioned ice man must have felt like. Huh? Oh. <laughs> who are you, I ask? Mrs. Carter, I am what is known in the investment business as a finder. My job is to find money for people who have bona fide projects, but who are short on cash, with which to develop them. Oh, that sounds like a lovely job. It is, when you find the money. You work on a percentage. Now, right now, out in California, there's a little man who some time ago bought a lot of oil rights covering a big piece of property. It's right near Newhall where there's been a lot of gushers coming in. He's got the property. I'm looking for the money with which to develop it. I hoped your husband would be interested. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of money in oil. Well, of course he's interested. I'll call him right away. Oh, before you do, maybe I'd uh, better tell you. What I'm looking for is a lot of money. Uh -huh. So, unless your husband has a lot available, it'll be no use. Well, I... He can get it. I'm sure he can get it. He, he's often told me all I needed was one big chance. Maybe this is it. I know where to reach him on the phone. Where can he reach you? A chance to make a lot of quick money melted the love light right out of Crystal Carter's eyes. And if anything, the money look that replaced it was even wilder. She moved fast. By the time I got back to my hotel, there was a message there telling me where I could find her husband, Chalmers. And her directions took me back into a taxi. Back across the Charles River, and move number three, to the Bayshore Trotting Club. A fancy little track where millionaires who like the smell of stables see how fast they can make horses trot. Chalmers Carter was up there among the rest, in spirit if not in prosperity, sitting in a low flat grandstand watching the afternoon workouts, knowingly holding a stopwatch in his hand, and keeping one eye on a blaze-faced filly who was kicking up the dust in the racing oval, and one ear on me. And as you may or may not know, Mr. Carter, the best thing about an oil investment, the first 27% of your income from it is tax-free. What? Say that again. That's right. The first 27% tax-free. Hmm. Uh, Dollar, just how hmm. much money do you need? 
Mm, about 120,000 should do it. Uh, huh? 120,000, huh? All right, I'll see what I can do about it. What did you say about 120,000, Carter? Uh, George. When you get I'll... your hands on 120,000, Chalmers, don't forget the 500 you owe me. Move number four. A quick trip back across the one more river I seem to have to cross, the Charles, to a pompous little apartment on Bay State Road, where I found your niece, Sophia. Very pretty, but uh, very stuffy. Your proposition interests me. However, I would naturally first have to check everything very closely with my business advisor. Oh, naturally. This first visit is only to find out whether you are interested and whether you do have money uh, immediately available. Immediately? Yes. I see. Very well. I think it can be managed. Then having made those moves, I was in a hurry to move you out of the way, which led me straight back to your flat on Pinckney Street, Beacon Hill. And there, once again, I bumped into what I've learned to expect in my racket, the unexpected. Your apartment door was slightly open. Your wheelchair was empty. And from outside, I saw you across the room, standing there, talking into something that earlier in the day you had very deliberately told me you didn't have. A telephone. Oh, Joseph. I'm so glad I was able to reach you. Now listen, I have another little job for you to do. I want you to come right over. Both of you. Yeah, you need Rocky, huh? You know where it is? No. No, this time it's somebody I have to get rid of. I took up a plant in the antique store across the street and waited for your visitors. They were charming. Just the sort of folks you'd expect to see on Beacon Hill, dropping in for a spot of afternoon tea. They were the kind of guys who never wear wristwatches, handcuffs being rough on watch crystals. I gave them a short lead upstairs and pussyfooted up behind them. Oh, one of these days my right eye is going to wind up shaped like a keyhole with my left ear shaped like a cauliflower from pressing against door panels. It's so nice having you young fellows around to depend on. Sit down, sit down. You want some nice tea and cake? No, thanks, dear. We just had some pizza and beer. Yeah, Joe and me just had some pizza and beer. What's on your mind, Grandma? Yeah, what's on your mind, Grandma? Well, boys, you know how worried I've been yes. about that family of mine. Yeah. Well, things are even worse now. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, what's up? Well, I want you to understand that it wasn't that I didn't have complete faith in your ability to protect them. Sure, sure, sure. But I finally turned to my insurance company, hoping to save a few dollars. Yeah. yeah. They sent a scoundrel named Dollar from Hartford to protect me, mind you. <laughs> and do you know what he did? No, what did he do? No, what did he do? Well, just to make sure this Dollar fellow... I called a private detective and had him followed when he left here. Yeah, good, good. And that detective told me that Dollar went to Sophia and my nephew Chalmers and is trying to entice them to kill me for my insurance money huh? so they can buy some phony oil stock he's trying to sell them. Huh? That guy sounds like a big operator. Yeah, that guy sounds like a big operator. Well, whatever he is. I want that young man out of the way. Grandma, dear, you don't really mean out of the way. That's exactly what I mean. Joseph, I see something I don't like very much. What is it? Some shadows moving around under the edge of the front door. Well, what are we waiting for? Yeah. Come here, you... I wasn't a match for one of those guys, let alone two. And Rocky, Big Sir Echo, not only repeated everything Joe said, he repeated everything Joe did. Take this! Oh. Yeah, take this! Oh. That's good. That's very good. Now, that's him. That's Dollar. You hold him. Hold him. Don't let him get away. Uh, Mr. Dollar, unless you're in a big hurry to get measured for a cement suit, don't start no funny business. Oh, uh, don't worry. I feel about as funny as a funeral my own. Well, I hope you've learned your lesson. Although, don't you think for a minute it's all over. This will teach you honesty is the best policy, and cheaters never prosper. Take it easy, Grandma, dear. This boy will not ever bother you again. <laughs> Come on, Buster. Yeah. Come on, Buster. Yeah. Go on, Buster. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, 
This fall, you hear them all on CBS, and you hear from the top mystery writers as well as top stars like Jack Benny, Bing Crosby, and the Lux Radio Theater luminaries. One such master of mystery, Raymond Chandler, and his world-famous private eye, Philip Marlowe, will be heard from later tonight on most of these same CBS stations. Be sure to hear this latest hard-bitten, wise-cracking adventure of Philip Marlowe later tonight, won't you? Tune in, tune in this fall for the show that you love best of all. Listen carefully, hear the address. It's CBS, CBS. Now with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Usually, when people are taken for a ride, at least it's a free one. However, Joseph and his friend Rocky didn't feel that way. So, expense account, item three, a buck twenty, cab fare, up Tremont Street toward Boston's South End. The three of us sat packed in the back of the taxi with me in the middle. And just as we passed King's Chapel burying ground, Rocky and Joseph suddenly felt the urge to be alone with me. Hey, driver, crank up your window. We wish to be in private. Well, it happens I had the crate fell off. Yeah, you and your lousy cab. Yeah, you and your lousy cab. But step on it! There were also things to step on in Joe's lousy hotel. Up in his room, they gave me the hot seat of honor on the edge of the bed, stood over me, one on each side, and issued me an invitation, but not to dance. We think you are a smart guy, Summer, and we want a piece of your action. What are you talking about? Yeah, Joe, what, what are you talking about? Rocky! Well, you just keep your muscles handy. I do the thinking and the talking. Okay, so go do it. Huh? What? Do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Where was we? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I was saying, Dollar, you've got a good racket, and we want a piece of your action. Oh. Okay, Joe. What do you think my action is? Last time, buddy. I've been around hustlers all my life, so you ain't fooling me. You set up the old lady to get knocked off, just like she said. Mm. In the meantime, you get all the people who will collect their insurance nice and ready to sell them some no-good oil stock. Yeah. Your hands are clean, except for a bush league swindle. The most you could get out of that is from three to five years, and that's the only chance you're taking. You... Joe, you're a genius. Well, let me ask you one thing, though. Why should I go to all that trouble? Why shouldn't I just sell my hot oil stock to the old lady in the first place and save all that extra trouble? Huh? Huh? Uh, yeah. That's where guys like you are smarter than guys like me. You got your reasons. You ain't kidding nobody. Hmm? We like the way you operate. And we want in. Oh, uh, I guess I've found myself a pair of partners. <laughs> Good. Hey. Yeah, shake. No, one at a time. Yo? Rocky? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is great. You know, Rocky and me have been taking Grandma for a few bucks now and then, protecting her from them squares, she's to say that. Oh. <laughs> but I never thought it would turn into anything as big as this. Just out of curiosity, how'd you guys meet Grandma in the first place? Uh, we was doing a little social break in the Nenton one night, and it turned out to be her house. Yeah. She got the drop on it, <laughs> We seen it air in our wheelchair, pushed her into the bedroom, and went to work. Yeah, yeah, went to work. And the next thing we know, she's standing there pointing a old shotgun at us. Yeah, yeah. What? You creep, that was no shotgun. What? Ah, what are you? Uh, it's a very hysterical musket. Oh. Stupid. Yeah, she told me. Yeah, let's see, where, where was we? Uh, oh, yeah, anyway, that's how we met. She made us a day out here. She wouldn't call the cops if we'd been returned. Besides, she paid us for it. We ought to have a bottle sent up, yeah? What for? Well, all we got to do is wait till the nephew or the niece knock off the lady. Uh, why not have a drink while we're waiting? Oh, whoa, now, hold everything. That's not the way to do it. How come? Yeah, how come? Now, look, if we sit here, we blow a big chance. The chance to get rid of whoever murders the old doll. We see who do it. We turn them in. They're out of the way, and the insurance money goes to the other one. Then I go to work on them. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see what I mean, Rocky? That's why guys like him has got more brains than guys like me. Yeah, 
More brains than guys like me, too. In space. Okay, Donna. What do we do? I was in a bad spot. But I'd put you, Andy Carter, in a worse one. Hoping to attract any bad apples that might be hanging on your family tree. Then all of a sudden you decided I was a worm and eliminated me as your number one protector. Among your spoiled family fruit, there was Nephew Chalmers, fishy-eyed and money-hungry, his wife Crystal, who was no killer to look at, but who could be sure of her with a gun in her hand. Then there was Sophia. She was stuffy, but strangely reminded me of a precocious young lady who strangled her mother so that she might wear her evening gown to her high school senior prom. So, when Joseph, expert in giving a fellow's eye a coat of many colors, asked me, what do we do now, I honestly didn't know. The best answer I could come up with was get back to where we could keep an eye on your address on Pinckney Street. But when we got there, Pinckney Street was blocked off by blue uniforms, and reinforcements were still arriving. Hey, what's going on? Yeah, what's going on? Well, you got to be sure of one thing. This ain't the policeman's ball. Look, how well are you guys known to the Boston police? Hey, some of their best quiz masters. You failed to make us talk. Yeah, they failed to make us talk. Okay, you better let me go ahead. I'm not too far ahead. Don't worry. Hey, look, Joseph... Uh, the cops are coming down out of her house. Oh, what do you mean now? Looks like the job is your turn. Yeah, I'd better get up the hill and find out for sure. Don't forget, partner, we're watching. Don't worry. Keep moving, boys. Just keep moving, mister. Hey, uh, officer. Keep moving. Officer. What? officer. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm Dollar of the Boston Globe. Yeah. What's going on? Am I going to make the front page? Yeah, you might. Well, what's it all about? Some dame, a friend of the commissioner's, called for protection. Oh, I thought it was a murder. It is. By the huh? time we get here, the dame up there is colder than Sunday morning beans. How do you like that? Uh, hey, Dollar, when you're writing this story, my my name is Fred Mosher. Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, Fred Mosher. Yeah, yeah. I used to play basketball for the boys' club of boxing. And when you're writing this story, put my name in, will you? Uh, the wife will get a kick out of it. Well, i got to get back to headquarters. Headquarters? Hey, officer, yeah. uh, uh, Fred, yeah. come here. Listen, I'll see that you get your name in the paper if you do me a favor. Oh. Act like you're arresting me, will you? A couple of friends of mine are just down the street. I want to pull a gag on them. Sure. With or without handcuffs. Anyway, just grab me by the elbow and throw me in that squad car. I could tell by the eyes of Joseph and Rocky that I had just successfully dissolved the partnership. At the corner of Arlington and Boylston, I swapped the patrol car for a cab. And, what do you know, I headed back across the Charles River to Cambridge. Oh, hello, darling. I'm sorry the maid wasn't here to answer the door. I'm all alone, isn't it? Come on Right here. Would you mind, Crystal, mm -hmm. walking just a few more steps ahead of me? It'll make you easier to follow. <laughs> yeah. uh, here we are. Make it down. Where's your husband? Oh, stop worrying about my husband. He had to go out for a while on business. I told you before, he always calls before he comes home. In case I want him to bring how long has he been gone? I wish to stop worrying about you. Why don't you stop paying attention to little Chris? Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now stop. Get a grip on yourself. Wait, oh, uh, watch it. No. Crystal, what are you up to? So. Oh, dear. Uh, stop it. Stop it, I say. Oh, it's you, Dollar. A finder, huh? Just what are you trying to find? Now, wait a minute, Carter. Oh, Thomas, thank heaven you got here. He forced his way in. He's from New York. I am not. I'm from Hartford. It's only my suit that's from New York. Why, you despicable cad. I I've a good notion to, to thrash you to within an inch of your life. I was certainly in no position to ask any questions around there, so I hit him a shot in the whiskers and left. <laughs> Where do you think I went? Back across the Charles River to Bay State Road and Nice to Fire's pompous little apartment. 
Nobody answered, so I broke rule number three in the book of how not to get your head split open when nobody answers the door. Picked the burglar's friend type lock and went in. I thought at first I'd set off a new polite kind of burglar alarm, but it was only a grandfather clock tolling out 10 p.m. as the moonlight boffed me smack in the kisser. First thing I saw out the window was my friend the Charles River, over which I'd made more crosses than the X-Man in a tic-tac-toe tournament. My tongue was as dry as that was wet. The second thing I saw, thanks to my fountain pen type flashlight, was an open drawer in a kidney-shaped desk. Sophia Carter was no housekeeper. The white paper lining inside it was dusty, except for the portion that held the vacant outline of a junior miss-sized revolver. Then the lights went on. Well, Mr. Dollar, you'll be the death of me yet. Auntie, what are you doing alive? Oh, you're surprised. <laughs> you hoped I'd be dead, didn't you? Well, I'm not. I'm not, you see? Yeah, I sure do see. But you'll be dead if I pull this trigger. Honey, <laughs> when I don't walk in on a man with a gun in his hand, it's a matter of courage. When I don't throw a flying tackle on a girl with a gun in her hand, it's a matter of etiquette. And when I don't get rough with an old lady holding a gun in her hand, it's a matter of knowing that your age, your reflexes are gone. You can be taught kind of things. With me holding your gun hand straight up overhead, I hope nobody's at home upstairs. Give me that. Let me go. Let me go. Don't you kill me. Everybody tries to kill me. Sophia was when she came to my flat this afternoon. Oh, which must mean that Sophia is the body in your flat tonight. The body I thought was yours. I know she was. She's been threatening to kill me for years. Well, what's that you've got in your other hand? No, no, you can't. Yeah, give it no, to me now. no, you can't. Come on. No, no, no. What I ripped out of her hand was a very old note written on very old paper. Give me that. And reading it, what with the clawing, scratching 82-year-old woman tucked under one arm, it read like a voice from out of the past. That is mine. The voice of that 82-year-old woman's long-dead husband, Caleb Carter. To my beloved niece, Sophia, in these last remaining moments of consciousness, I tell you this. My wife, Melanie, has made repeated attempts upon my life. This time... I'm afraid she has succeeded. Also, crushing the light from your father, my brother, beneath the wheels of her carriage as he rushed to my rescue. Well, I guess this means that Sophia had this letter and has been holding it over your head for years. You've been blackmailing me. Blackmailing me. Blackmailing me. Melanie. It was your conscience that first called me into this case to protect you from your relatives. It was your conscience that hired that private detective to protect you from me. And it was your conscience that got you mixed up with Joe and Rocky to protect you from the detective and me. Then again, it was that same old conscience that called in the police to protect you from your gangster friends. Now there's only one more thing, I hope. What's that? That that same conscience will prevent you from making an undignified surrender. My arm. Thank you, young man. You are. Expense account, item four, 15 bucks, pipe and slippers. Appeasement to Charmer's Carter, nephew of the accused to give him a symbol that all I was really trying to find was a way to straighten out his home life. Item five, fifty dollars. Uh, a personally autographed check in lieu of his name in the paper to patrolman Fred Mosier so that the wife would still get a kick out of the publication of his name on the payable to line of said check. Expense account item six, fifteen dollars. Gift to Joseph and Rocky. One roll of tickets on the River Queen sightseeing boat which gives daily round-trip tours of the Charles River. Maybe they'll do me a favor and fall in. Uh, item 7, $5.98. Airfare, Boston to Hartford. Expense account total? Uh, uh, what's the use? Where you are now, Aunt Melanie Carter, you're never going to be in a position to pay. 
I won't even bother to sign it. Yours, mm, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell, script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Be sure to be with us at the same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. A $185 suit, well, welcome back, by the way, a $185 suit in 2009 dollars would be a $1,647 suit uh, that uh, Johnny Dollar was wearing. But he's got expensive ca- uh, taste, but I think we knew that already. Once again, we see... Uh, and this is the second time um, we, we've heard this in the Charles Russell run, uh, where Johnny Dollar has a non-paying expense account. Uh, you can't have uh, too many, uh, too many of those, particularly with the ways that uh, he spends money. I haven't heard that a whole lot of. Um, on any of the Bailey Five Parters I've been listening to, uh, I did hear one uh, non-paying um, uh, account when I was I was doing some sampling of other dollars, and I heard one with Mandel Kramer where he had one where he didn't get paid. But uh, yeah, you got to keep those ones to a minimum. All right, well we have some more comments to get into. Jennifer writes. Adam, I know you get many suggestions for additional souls, uh, but I would like to offer one more. Candy Madsen. There were several female detective shows during the old-time radio period, but I think Candy Madsen was the best, and I believe uh, that there are still multiple episodes of these shows available. Just a thought, and keep up the good work, Jen. Well, thanks so much, uh, Jen. I I think uh, I've actually... Candy Madsen is one of those shows where I've listened to every... um, uh, every episode in existence. And it's one I definitely want to do. Um, and uh, kind of, um, we, we, we'll, uh, we'll be talking about what we'll be doing next, but that one's definitely on there. Um, I, I think that what, what generally, uh, there have been were several female detective shows. This one made it uh, qu- uh, a couple of years on the air. Uh, and I think the other important thing uh, is that it, uh, it is that it had surviving copies. Uh, another pretty good, pretty good uh, female detective show was focused on an actual policewoman, Lieutenant Mary Sullivan. We did it as an extra uh, on the Dragnet podcast for our uh, Dragnet app. But that one, that one episode of uh, Policewoman. It kind of makes, kind of really made me wonder uh, j- just how good that, good it was. It sounded pretty good, particularly for a 15 minute show. Um, good acting, good writing, and good stories, uh, actually from true to life. So hope more of that one come forward. But definitely, we're going to enjoy some Candy Matson. Comment from Podcast Alley. I accidentally stumbled across this podcast by accident, and now I'm going through all the old podcasts. It's great, especially the old Jack Webb ones as Pat Novak. They leave me chuckling. Try some, and you'll enjoy them, too. And uh, we, uh, speaking of uh, Pat Novak, uh, we had another uh, comment um, fr- uh, from Betty, who writes that uh, of Pat Novak... Uh, he was one of my favorites even before I found out he was Jack Webb. And uh, another uh, one of our Facebook comments. Amanda says, I listen to old time radio every night when I go to bed. I found this podcast just over a month ago and have almost completely caught up already. I've learned a great many things about the shows and their actors that I didn't know previously, and I really like that. Congrats, guys, for having uh, put together a great and enjoyable podcast. And a final one, just a nice enjoy your podcast on Podcast Alley. Well, thanks so much for all your support and comments. We will be back next week with uh, Box 13 on Monday. And, of course, on Friday we'll return with yours truly, Johnny Dollar. 
Uh, got any comments, send them to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, please become a fan of the show on Facebook, facebook.greatdetectives.net. Uh, but from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.